Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is our regular South uh, Council meeting for the City of Southfield being held on Monday, September 19th, 2022 at 6 p.m. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Banks. Present. Brightwell. Here. Cruz. Present. Frazier. Hoskins. Here. Mandelbaum. Present. And Taylor here, Madam President, you do have a quorum to excuse Councilman Frazier and Mayor Cyber is in attendance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, would we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. Mayor, were you going to speak before communications? Yes. Okay. We have a quick. Good evening, Council. Uh, this evening, I don't believe they're present. Uh, I know uh, one person was out of town. Uh, these are simple uh, reappointments to the City Center Advisory Board. Uh, Josh Wardini is with um, uh, 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 Soschek. So, so check, thank you. Uh, tongue tied. And Kimberly Peterson with Transwestern, um, manager of the town center. Uh, they've served uh, very well on the board, and I'm asking council to approve a reappointment of these individuals this evening. Okay, excuse me. I thought we were, that there was something special that you wanted the mayor to. No, there was an ADA request this evening to act to. Uh, say that the mayor is in attendance by a, a blind individual because they are listening to the meetings. So I advise that I will let them know that the mayor was here. I'm sorry. Mayor, I'm sorry. I took you out of- I didn't, I didn't get that memo. There was an ADA request to yeah. verbally say you were in the meeting because a viewer could not view the meeting. They were only, can only listen oh, to okay. the meeting. I didn't hear that. Yep, it was an ADA request. Thank you. That's um, why I said yes, what I Kent's said. Yes, Kenton Cyber mayor is verbally <laughs> present. Thank you. Physically present in this meeting. Okay, then I'm going to ask you if we would hold off on doing the appointments because communications is next. Thank you. Sorry for all the confusion. I apologize. Thank you very much. Uh, audience and uh, everyone here, please uh, excuse me for uh, being out of order just a little bit. We have our communications next. Uh, the Southfield City Council has established the following rules of procedure for all speakers. No speaker may make personal or impertinent attacks upon any officer, employee, or city council member or other elected official that is unrelated to the manner in which the officer, employee, or city council member or elected official performs his or her duties. No person shall use abusive or threatening language toward any individual when addressing the city council. Any person who violates this, this section shall be directed by the presiding officer to be orderly and silent. If a person addressing the council refuses to become silent when so directed, such person may be deemed by the presiding officer to have committed a breach of the peace by disrupting and impeding the orderly conduct of the public meeting of the city council and may be ordered by the presiding officer to leave the meeting. If the person refuses to leave as directed, the presiding officer may direct any law enforcement officer who is present to escort the violator from the meeting. Thank you for your attention. Our first speaker is, I believe it's Ju Juara Jackson. Please come forward. You'll have three minutes to speak. Good evening, Council. My name is Gerard Jackson. I'm here, the son and representative of my mother, Perry Jackson. She was in the back. Uh, she's a resident of Circle Drive. Uh, the main purpose of me addressing the city council is the relationship we have with Lawrence Tech University. First, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself and my mother. We have uh, resided on Circle Drive since 1976, the neighbors of Lawrence Tech. That's 46 years. I'm a local educator. My mother is a Vietnam veteran, a disabled cancer survivor, and has been a businesswoman in the city of Southfield for the last 30 plus years. So we have and are part of this community. 
My main grievance is with the unneighborly policies and interactions of our local university, Lawrence Tech. Our property in recent years has become totally encircled by the rezoning efforts and property acquisitions of Lawrence Tech, Tech which is not my issue tonight. However, in the past, we have seen Lawrence Tech rent out to vandals, and on, one, on more than one occasion, our home has been broken into. Community improvements such as sewage insulation has been thwarted by the university. Wetlands have disappeared. They have changed to make up the neighborhood, lowering property values. But the matter on hand is an issue I had uh, on multiple occurrences, a tree falling on our property from Lawrence Tech, Tech's property, and their poor communication involved uh, about the tree. So this is not the first time that a tree has fallen from Lawrence Tech pop property and has been ignored in our request for attention at the issues and my mother has paid for the tree removal in the past. Once again, last year a tree fell in August and the tree fell onto our property. Debris littered our pool in our yard. Lawrence Tech did after a delay remove some logs. I had a conversation with the university representative, Janelle Greer, and told her that the rest of the tree was dead and rotting and needed to be removed. She flatly said no. However our, our, however, our fence was damaged. A month later, the rest of the tree failed and completely destroyed our, tr our, our fence and prevented the use of our backyard. At various times, Lawrence Tech sent out a fence estimator and then a surveyor because they pointedly said that this was not on their property, but it was. Uh, my emails were not returned until the spring. Meeting requests with the university and maintenance pr president, Mr. Valentine, have been ignored. Meeting schedules have been changed and are often not confirmed by the university. Then one summer evening, a few weeks ago, the university uh, representative found my 77-year-old mother and said to her they would do nothing. Now it was an act of God after a year. While I feel the university actions and communications are unacceptable, and we want the fence fixed, as well we want at least a proper response from the university. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Copy to the clerk. Yes, please. The copy of the email correspondence. Thank you. The next speaker I have is your uh, Miss Pearlie Jackson. That's my mother. I was speaking for her. Okay. Next, we'll have Mr. Greg Keeler. Gary Keeler, resident of Southfield. Uh, five years ago, Mrs. Jackson appealed her property taxes because there's no sewer line on Circle Drive. The tax assessor had to go and speak to the mayor to believe what was being told to him when both of us told her there is no sewer line on it. We ended up winning the case because they were assessing our property too high. So, now with him just saying that they've been there for 30 some years or 50 some years, I believe the assessor said, um, we've been overtaxed for 50 some odd years. Will we get the money back? Um, the funny thing is, she fought because there was no sewer line there. How did she get a ticket saying she must attach to the sewer line? Other than reading the black letter law of which I wrote here as an ordinance. Then in that ordinance it says, we're going to take your house if you don't comply. So how are you going to comply to something that's not there? I think they should have looked to find out that Circle Drive does not have a sewer line. Even though the bond said we were going to put it where none exists, Circle Drive would have been one of them streets that did not exist. So you did not follow your bond and did not do what you were supposed to say. And the reason why you didn't do it was because Lawrence Tech owned five pieces of property out of 27 homes and said no. 
And because they said no, the other 27 of us, the other 22 of us had to suffer. And our property values had to go down. Now, if y'all didn't like buying property or having property go cheaper, and Lawrence Tech did not want to give us our money for our property, they wanted to undervalue paying it to us. But they are the one that put us in this unreasonable spot. So when you talk about Lawrence Tech is a good neighbor and this and that, no, not if you speak to the people that lived on Circle Drive. And what they said, we had talked about before they built the dorm on the street, that the students were having all the parties and all the noise and everything else on our street and the problems we were having then. Now it has changed somewhat only because those houses have been knocked down due to the fact there is no sewer line. So when the septic tanks went bad, they knocked them down. The, the people that they have moved into the neighborhood that he was talking about also, a couple of them have moved from house to house, and each house has been slowly gotten rid of or knocked down. So if you want to know what the, the Lawrence Tech effect is on our street, 17 homes missing. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last speaker for this evening. We do not have any presentations, and now we can do our reappointments, um, Mayor Cyber. My apologies. I was trying to read the city clerk's lips, and I thought she said, go for the appointment, so <laughs> not to announce that I was here. So, anyhow, I'll, I'll start again. Um, reappointment to the, uh, two reappointments to the City Center Advisory Board, uh, Josh Wardini of uh, Shostak Realty and uh, Kimberly Person of the Transwestern uh, Southfield uh, uh, City Center. Um, recommending their reappointment, they've just uh, served with uh, distinction. Madam President, yes. I'd like to move the reappointments of Josh Sardini and Kimberly Peterson to the City Center Advisory Board. Support. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Cruz, supported by Councilman Mandelbaum, for the reappointment to City Center Advisory Board of both Josh Sardini, Sardini and Kimberly Peterson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Are they here, uh, Mayor? Uh, no, they're not. Okay. Uh, one is on her way back from Hawaii. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, for clarification, did we get who had the second on that? Mandelbaum. Thank you. Council, we have a set of minutes to approve. Um, Madam President, we do have a slight uh, amendment to the minutes to add Indian Wells, California to the index of the travel report that was approved by Council of Mine and to add it also to the resolution, the city and the state of the um, place where the conference took place. Thank you. Council, we have amended minutes. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to move the approval of the regular meeting minutes of August 15th, 2022, as amended. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Mandelbaum, supported by Councilwoman Banks, to approve our regular meeting minutes of August 15th, 2022, as amended. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Council, next we have our consent agenda items. We have um, three items. The first is item A, which is the authorization to renew grant agreement between the State of Michigan, Michigan Indigent Defense Commission, Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, in the city of Southfield. Item B is the agreement with the Road Commission for Oakland County for winter road maintenance for 2022 through 2023. And item C is the authorization to apply for urban and community forestry program grant. Council, is any of these items- Madam Chair. Do you have a question or, does anyone have a question or want any of these items pulled? I do. Council uh, Brightwell. Well, I wanna pull item three for a um, brief discussion, and I don't necessarily want to okay. have a question about it right now. Okay. 
Council, are we ready to vote on items A and B? Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to move the approval of consent agenda items A and B. Support. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Mandelbons, supported by Councilman Hoskins for the approval of consent agenda items A and B as presented here tonight. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, for discussion we have item C. You have a question, Councilman Brightwell? Yes, I would like to know um, where, where would these trees be planted and historically where have we planted trees? <clears throat> Councilman, as one of the requirements for the grant, it has to be in those areas that either have uh, low or no trees or is uh, social justice and equity high marks. Uh, at this point, we're focusing on the Shiawassee area, uh, the area by Clara Lane, and a few of the other areas that are meeting the criteria. Since we're only talking 34 trees, there isn't a lot of you know, choices to make at this point. We are hoping that in the future we can expand this program to include many more of the areas in the residential that are denuded okay. of trees. Yeah, I think I recall this, this seemed like a reoccurring thing that we do frequently every year, seemingly we are planting trees somewhere based on a grant and historically, is this correct? We're getting for these the grants on a history. For the chair? Yes, in the past, Mr. Brightwell, we've applied for a DTE, uh, Energy Tree Planting Grant, which is typically $4,000 match. But this, this, is, this will expand up to $20,000. We put a $10,000 match. So this is a newer program that allow us to purchase more trees and plant more trees. So this is not similar to our recurring DTE tree, tree okay. planting program. Okay. Um, well, that's good to know. But do we have a record of where we have planted trees, and is that available? I just want to, because I I do recall frequently something about planting trees. I, I'm trying to get a, a picture of where we historically plant trees. So. Um, We'd have to consult with our public works because we have a urban forester that plants trees. We have our parks department that plants trees. And um, the charter gives me the authority for operating the tree, tree trust fund. And we've been planting trees along our trails and sidewalks in All our right. public rights away. Okay. Um, is, there any, is there any way I and on a council can get a, a report historically where we have been planting trees? Uh, this is purely from a environmental standpoint, and I would like to be on record of saying that we plant trees, and this is where we have planted trees historically. So I'm just trying to get some um, factual data that I can relay to citizens and or anybody else that uh, indicates Southfield is not uh, environmentally friendly. Public Works can assemble all the documents we have available. The only downside is, is as you know, in May of, or sorry, in February of this year, we changed who our forester is. Uh, Leo had retired, so we're trying to access his records. So we'll have a comprehensive report to the council. Okay. Well, I don't want to bog you guys down. I don't want to create um, undue burden, but. Uh, if we can, I will be asking for this on a yearly basis. So if we can get something that, that is um, transferable and is solid and it will be there upon request, I would appreciate right. it. I can't tell you for the last few years, unfortunately, due to COVID and financial, um, the city has not planted as many trees as they want. In fact, uh, the city now has a grant through the Friends of the Rouge we're meeting on this week to see how we can accelerate and purchase trees and expand that. That would be in the Rouge section of the city, the Rouge River. So that will be affect the report for next year. Okay. And, and I, um, I live along 11 Mile. I know there's some trees planted there years ago, and those trees are large now. And I just happen to notice it since I wrapped my bank and, you know, those kind of things. Uh, so, but it will be a, 
a recurring uh, request of mine to, to get a report so we can have a, so, you know, it's just, it's just good to show data to indicate these, these are pockets where we have planted trees. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, You're Patrick. welcome. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, with that, I move that we approved um, consent agenda item C, the authorization to apply for urban, urban and community forestry program grant. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilwoman Banks, to approve the authorization to apply for the urban and community forestry program grant. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion Thank you. Here. That brings us to our public hearing and our first one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I know we have a number of these um, to introduce and consider tonight. Our first public hearing is PZR ODD 22-001. Petitioner Hassan Jawad representing Middle Point Investment Group. The site is located at 26111 Evergreen Road. It's the vacant parcel across the street from City Hall, located on the northwest corner of Evergreen and Civic Center Drive. Council has previously approved uh, an overlay development district for this site. Mr. Jawad has, has worked dil diligently to um, increase density on both in housing and retail. And so he's before us tonight to um, amend the original ODD, uh, maximize spaces and with the construction of 1,500 parking spaces, part of which was um, in a parking structure, previously it was 800. Um, buildings have been increased um, in gross square foot, minimum apartment size, 325 feet. The building height has increased from six to eight stories, and there are a number of other architectural design elements. Uh, this is the uh, current vacant parcel, the zoning of future land use. This is the uh, development that council previously approved in 2021. Uh, you may recall that it had a story and a half retail set back from Evergreen Road towards the front. There were some other one to two story freestanding buildings with residential in the rear up to six, six stories in height. Uh, this is the uh, latest rendering. Uh, you can see there's, it's a much more denser development, a mixed use on, on the front on Evergreen with retail on the first floor, residential above, a substantial parking structure um, that will have some inline retail, and then uh, two larger, more dense residential developments to the rear of the property. Uh, again, this is a side-by-side -side comparison uh, from what was previously approved and what um, the developer is looking for at this time. A couple close-ups. I'm going to ask Mr. Jawad to come up and, and give you an overview of the changes in the proposal. And um, this is the overall change to the site plan. He's eliminated the on-street or surface parking lot along Evergreen and pushed the building up closer, creating a street wall both on Evergreen Road and Civic Center Drive uh, and utilizing the existing parking structure to provide for some inlay retail development on that um, east-west connector road between Central Park Boulevard and Evergreen Road. Uh, he's still uh, proposing the standalone restaurant with drive-through coffee shop, with some building elevations. And uh, before we open it for a public hearing, I ask Mr. Jawad to come up and Good evening, uh, members of council, staff, <clears throat> Hassan Jawad, Middle Point Investment Group. Let me start by saying uh, um, it's been a long uh, road to uh, get here. This has been a truly a, a passion uh, project uh, for us. Um, our site plan has gone through many iterations to, uh, to get to this point, and uh, we're finally, I believe, to a point where we feel uh, it's right. Um, I'd like to thank um, staff and especially Planner Crowe for his uh, patience and, and guidance and, uh, and input uh, uh, on our project uh, as well. Um, but uh, the, the changes 
uh, that you see before you comparative to the, uh, the plan that was previously submitted uh, is significantly more uh, dense. Uh, we are going to have an upwards of 450 to 500 apartments uh, on the site uh, when all is said and done. Uh, we are going to eliminate the seas of asphalt that we typically see on Evergreen Road by doing uh, zero lot uh, lines for the building that is fronting uh, Evergreen so that we have a truly uh, uh, walkable uh, development uh, fronting on Evergreen as opposed to having to cross through a parking lot to get to a, uh, uh, an establishment as well as uh, extensive pedestrian uh, amenities and pathways running uh, not only uh, north and south on our site but also east and west between Evergreen and, uh, and Central Park. Um, we've also included a, um, a number of public spaces including pocket parks as well as a, uh, a park uh, as you can see towards the, uh, towards the center of the site for programming uh, and events um, uh, as, as well as um, uh, providing a uh, some nature as opposed to just strictly an urban uh, feel uh, to the site. If you take a look uh, at the buildings, you'll notice that uh, the two buildings in the rear also have uh, courtyards in the center. And the reason that we have that is, is that was uh, one to promote density so that we could have a double loaded corridor. So either you could have a courtyard slash pool view or a city view. Um, and uh, Every, it, it ultimately lends itself to a scenario where everybody has a, uh, a, a view, so to speak, and it also lends itself to density uh, on the site. I've spent <clears throat> a lot of time uh, in the city center uh, during business hours, after business hours, walking it uh, from, from 10 Mile to 696 to uh, Red Pole Park and all the way around to try to figure out and, and understand fully uh, what this city center needs. And I, I think um, we are gonna check uh, all the boxes here in providing sit down establishments, by providing a pedestrian friendly environment, by providing uh, a, a public and open spaces, uh, as well as high end amenities uh, in our uh, residential buildings as well, and provide uh, a level of housing and amenities that does not currently uh, exist in the uh, in the city, uh, but I am here to uh, to answer any questions uh, you might have. I will say that we are <coughs> uh, fine tuning uh, some additional things behind uh, the scenes. This is, as I said, it's a passion project, and uh, you know, we've taken a look at a lot of other developments, uh, not only in the surrounding area but in other states, and uh, we are. Uh, doing some things relative to the parking deck uh, uh, to ensure sustainability uh, because we know that as time progresses that the number of parking spaces uh, that are going to be required um, with autonomous vehicles and ride sharing and all of the other things that are, are coming around, um, we want to make sure that we don't end up with a concrete dinosaur on the corner of Evergreen and, and, uh, and Civic Center. So there's a lot of thought <coughs> going into that parking deck. If some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, the dot parking uh, deck in, uh, in Ferndale, um, uh, they've done, it's actually a mixed use uh, deck where they've incorporated some retail into the deck. They've incorporated a uh, higher level first floor. So if they decide to repurpose uh, the first floor in the future and utilize it for something else because you don't need as much parking, you'll have the <coughs> availability to do that. Um, parking decks are being built with level floors so that in the future, if you decide that you want to convert the building to be uh, usable, uh, that you can do that. Parking decks are being built with higher ceilings to allow for repurposing uh, as well. Um, different things like placing elevators in the center of the parking deck, and so you're not having uh, sloped floors and such. Um, so those are a lot of the little things that we're kind of fine tuning and, and continue to fine tune uh, behind the scenes. Admittedly so, I've, I've made our architectural team a bit uh, crazy uh, in the process, but uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, uh, this is a passion project and, uh, and it's being treated as such, but I'm, I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. I would recommend that we hold the public hearing first. Yep, Thank you. Say, this, this is a public hearing. 
I will now declare the public hearing open. If there's anyone in the audience that would care to speak to this item, please come forward. Okay, seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. So council. Madam Chair, through the council before you um, have any que further questions. Um, substantially, this project is as you see it, but as Mr. Jawad has stated, there are some last minute tweaks to the parking structure. So I'm asking uh, that council take no action on this item tonight and bring it back for October 3rd for approval and introduction. But um, we wanted to hold the public hearing because this has been already postponed twice. And uh, again, uh, the project is substantially as you see it, but Mr. Jawad is working out some final details on the parking structure to add the retail, which I think will be an enhancement. And He's comfortable with waiting for, for two weeks before council takes any action. Okay. So do you want council to ask questions yes, tonight? I, yes, just so we know if there's anything else. I just wanted to state up front that there will be no action taken tonight. Thank you. Council, do we have any questions? Councilman Mandelbaum? Thank you. Looking at this picture and then some of the documents that were given to us, and I think even the last time we saw, there was a like a bridge over the two or a parking deck that went between the two residential buildings in the back? Um, or is this the most accurate where there are this, two separate this, buildings? This, 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 is the, uh, this is the most accurate um, and, and that is uh, uh, one of the things that is on the, uh, on the radar is, is uh, uh, creating uh, a secure connection uh, from the deck to the residential buildings uh, as well. But you are, you are correct. As I said, it's, uh, it's it's gone through numerous iterations and has uh, it's been continuously evolving until we have gotten to, to, to where we are at now. So and yes, uh, in a previous iteration, there was a parking structure that connected the back to residents. That's been a significant change that's um, being updated here. And some of the other details Mr. Jawad had indicated is some type of pedestrian bridging that connects all the buildings to the parking structure. That'll be finalized before the October 3rd. No, those, those are the only other major changes that would potentially be made at pedestrian bridges. The, yeah, the significant, uh, uh, significant changes or the major changes revolve around the, the parking deck. Um, designs to the deck, uh, connectivity to the deck, and as I uh, mentioned uh, uh, previously, um, uh, we're looking at incorporating potentially incorporating a, a mixed use component to the deck. So if you look at the interior road there uh, that is running uh, east and west between Evergreen and Central Park, mm -hmm. you'll notice there's a pretty expansive stretch of deck there. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 245 feet long and um, uh, we want to uh, add a component to that deck that is a mixed use component that will provide uh, uh, some retail on that interior uh, corridor uh, across from the coffee shop and across from the uh, uh, from the park. Still occupying the same footprint, but all we would do is embed uh, some additional uh, uh, space uh, into the uh, into the deck. Okay, and the deck would have parking all the way, including that top floor. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Hassan originally didn't he, didn't he have a parking deck in the back? So, so that's what yeah. Councilman Manuel no, was talking about. No, there was the bridge. There, there, there was uh, there was a, uh, a deck to the rear that uh, that had a uh, uh, that was kind of wrapped uh, uh, by the uh, by the building. Well, I think this is an improvement. Thank you. Because <laughs> you, you can go straight through for that's traffic flow on the site. It did, the last iteration I saw, it didn't appear, you had to go in and out of um, I, I agree with you and I've lost many hours of sleep and as I said, I've, I've tortured the architectural team uh, uh, as we've moved forward and have gotten to this point. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad, I'm glad you, uh, you approve of, uh, of this design. And um, it's a five story parking deck, correct? That's correct. And uh, approximately now how many spaces? 
uh, that, that current deck uh, has 825 parking spaces in it right. currently. And then you have the surface uh, spaces. So how many t uh, parking spaces total? Uh, entirely on the site. Uh, I don't have the number off the, okay. top of, off the top of my head. I will tell you uh, one thing that we did do um, as our our calculations go, uh, we actually, because again, we anticipate that the trend is going to be less uh, uh, vehicle parking required, and we used uh, 1.2 parking spaces per apartment as opposed to the typical 1.5. 1.2 is equivalent to what hotels use. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we did with our retail uh, square footage, we have approximately 30,000 square feet of retail square footage and we allocated 20,000 square feet of that retail square footage as restaurant so that we would ensure that we were adequately parked. Um, and, that's, and that's, again, why we went back to the drawing board and went to a centralized deck that would serve the entirety of the site as opposed to a deck that was intertwined or wrapped uh, within the residential buildings. Uh, not to get into the nitty gritty of the construction side of things, but now with the buildings all being independent and freestanding, this is a topic I know very well because I eat it, sleep it, and breathe it so I can rattle this off to you. Um, we no longer have a parking deck that needs to be built first before we can start going vertical yeah. with our buildings. In the previous iterations, when you had the wrap and you had the buildings around the concrete deck, you had to build that deck first before you could start going vertical with your buildings. Now the deck is its own freestanding entity, and if there's a six to eight month or 10 month time frame for precast concrete, there's nothing stopping us from doing work on the rest of the site. So there's, there's a rhyme and a reason, and as I've stated uh, uh, throughout this project, there's a lot of moving parts and, and thought that go into some of those things. But that, what that does for us is that helps us speed up our timeline on building. Mm -hmm. It helps reduce escalation costs because we're able to complete construction in a shorter amount of time than originally anticipated as well. But I mean, it's, I'm perhaps for um, October third, you could have the total count of parking spaces. Yes, absolutely. If I could, the, the range that's proposed is eight seventy-five to fifteen hundred. Say that again. The range of parking is eight hundred seventy-five up to fifteen hundred oh, okay. spaces. Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm guessing off the top of my head that we are probably sitting at somewhere between 1,000 and 1,100 spaces currently. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Councilwoman Banks. Thank you. Um, I think the mayor asked my question, but just to confirm, you said presently the parking deck has 825 spaces. That's correct. And the, the difference between that and 1,500 is parking on the site? Mr. Crow we, said we, 1,500. We have, a, we have approximately um, a total um, uh, 1,000 to 1,100 uh, of parking space. So but 825 in the deck and the balance being uh, surface parking. I, I think um, you had, you had um, expressed that if you needed to add a couple stories to yep. the parking structure, that's where you would get the, so the I'll, balance I'll, of the parking. Yes. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, <clears throat> so, so we, we want, we, we know that initially we are going to build uh, the building fronting Evergreen, the parking deck, the park, and the building that sits immediately behind the, uh, the parking deck. Uh, the, the plan is, is, as you can see, the two buildings to the rear look very similar to each other, except the one uh, to the north is, is uh, slightly larger. The idea is to take the lessons uh, learned, uh, as we say uh, on the back end, from building C and apply it to, uh, 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 to building D. But we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, we did not have to come back again if, uh, if there was a need to uh, increase parking or add a level to the deck or whatever the case might be. So that's why we've 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 padded the uh, the range of parking on the uh, on the ODD. Okay, so it it sounds like the difference is going to be made up in the parking structure, not 
on the surface ground. Yeah, I, there's yeah, there's, there's not. It doesn't look like there's enough room. That's correct. We're 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 utilizing uh, we're utilizing every inch of the of the site that we possibly can. And then where is the restaurant on this site again? So, Do we have a pointer that? Yeah. So, so, so there there's yeah. Uh, so we got so we got retail here with we the, got ten thousand square feet of of retail space on the first floor of that building fronting Evergreen Zero Lot. And then each of the buildings in the back currently have approximately 10,000 square feet of first floor uh, commercial space uh, as well. But didn't you say last week that there was a freestanding restaurant being proposed on this property? There's a freestanding coffee shop sitting towards the front there with the pocket park and the uh, outside seating. Okay, so what happened to the, rest, the freestanding restaurant? I, I, we never had a freestanding restaurant. I thought there was. What? <laughs> what? What I? What I? What I, I? I may have said, or you may have heard, was uh, we are pushing for uh, the majority of sit-down restaurants as opposed to fast, uh, as opposed to fast casual uh, restaurants, and that is the direction that we are trying to go. Here is uh, we want uh, uh, restaurants that are going to not only serve the daytime lunchtime crowd, but also uh, evenings, uh, evenings and weekends. So we're pushing for sit down restaurants throughout the, uh, the majority of the site as best we can. And you don't think where your coffee shop is being proposed like a, a sit down restaurant, you know, enclosed by with like a glass atrium all the way around similar to what they have downtown would not complement this project or no? I, I there's there's no coffee in this corridor. Um, oh, so you said a coffee shop. We, no, there's no more coffee. We don't have coffee in the corridor. We don't have a coffee shop in the corridor currently. Okay, the last outside. coffee shop that was in this corridor was, was, the, Tim Hort was the Tim Hortons, and uh, um, that's been gone for a number of years. So we, we are, I, I think, in, in dire need of having a, a place for, uh, uh, to, to get coffee. Uh, in this corridor, and, and I think the drive-through is, uh, is an important component of that as well. Having it next to a park and having extensive outside seating, I think it becomes a, uh, a gathering place, and that's what we're trying to do here is, is, is create a, uh, a, a gathering place. Okay, thank you. You're I welcome. I was hoping for a freestanding restaurant. <laughs> it's a small one. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Councilman Brightfoot. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of your passion for your project here. Thank you. And um, the retail that the, the retail that you speak of and the retail that you bring in, do you anticipate that retail being sustained by the this facility and the occupants of this the, these uh, these facilities that you're building? I, I think having the captive audience helps, um, and I think that we are trying to. Uh, handpick uh, the establishments that go there. I don't, as I said, we were, we're planning on, on 20 of our 30,000 square feet to, to, to be restaurant, but I think that there needs to be other amenities and services uh, uh, on the site to, uh, to cater uh, to, uh, 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 to the people that, uh, that live there. If we're going to push to have the density here and we're looking to make it a truly walkable uh, uh, community, um, I think we all would love to have the ability to walk out our front door. I know, Mayor, you want to market, and, and, and we're, we're pushing and, and working hard for those things, but things like markets and pharmacies and, and things that you don't necessarily have to jump in your car to go and do dry cleaners, etc. There are other things outside of food that uh, I think um, uh, we're looking for convenience. Uh, we're looking to not spend money on gas. We're looking to uh, especially even during COVID, we all stayed in our own little worlds, and if our amenities are all within uh, close proximity and walking distance, I, I think that is going to continue uh, to be the uh, to be the trend, uh, along with uh, outside seating, uh, along with outside spaces, um, and uh, even things uh, that we've talked about in the past of uh, uh, building in things such as uh, a carry out and pick up windows and designated parking spaces for delivery dry food services and so forth. All of those things have, have, have uh, uh, been worked uh, into our plans as well as 
uh, uh, you know, charging stations and, and, and things along those lines that, again, it's, it's about uh, convenience, it's about sustainability, it's about uh, creating a place that people actually uh, want to live and uh, uh, not only uh, in our development, but um, in the surrounding neighborhoods as well. And I, I said this from the beginning with this project, the important, uh, uh, the important way, the important thing about a development like this is in, in, in wanting to to build a city is to, and we use the word downtown, and I keep using the word city center, is to have a strong core. And if you have a strong core, the outer rings around it suddenly become more appealing and more valuable. And we have some older housing stocks uh, in the Evershire neighborhoods and, and, and so forth that suddenly, you know, maybe you don't want to live in an apartment and maybe you want to buy a house down in Hilton or, or, or Goldman or, or uh, one of the other streets over there along by the, the, uh, the golf course and maybe you build something new, you buy one of those empty lots or maybe you rehab one of those homes because now there's something that uh, you want to live near, uh, you want to walk to. And, that's, and that, that was, the, I think, the biggest lesson that I learned of coming here after hours and walking on the weekend. Evergreen Road, kudos to planning, is beautiful. It's, we get all sorts of positive feedback in regards to the Evergreen Road of now comparative to the Evergreen Road of then. But as I said, I've walked from 10 Mile to 696 and down Civic Center, and the problem was there was nowhere for me to walk to. It looked nice, it felt nice, but there weren't a lot of people out there either. And once you, st once you veer off of Evergreen Road and you get into Civic Center and you start walking toward Northwestern Highway and Red Pole Park, there has to be somewhere for me to go. And so what we're looking to do here, and, and I haven't used this word yet, is create a destination, not only for uh, the city and its residents, but also to bring people here from the outside. And I, I, think, I think this, uh, uh, this development uh, uh, will do that. Okay. Um, let me just ask this and one more. Thing more. This captive audience that you will have. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we assume it will sustain anything that is put there from a retail standpoint. That's the running narrative, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think it's not only there to, uh, to, to cater and service to the people that live there, but it, it's also uh, uh, to the surrounding neighborhoods and, and uh, the business people that frequent uh, our city on a daily basis uh, uh, as well. Okay. Uh, and I, I mentioned just the s silly things such as a dry cleaners that Listen, business people got lots of dry cleaning, and it ha there has to be a convenient place to uh, to drop it off when you get off of 696 and you're heading to the town center. And there isn't a dry cleaners even in this corridor. So those are you know those are some of the things that uh, that we've kind of thought through and and uh, and have thought about. And uh, somebody wants to grab a cup of coffee without getting out of their car on the way to work. That doesn't exist on Evergreen Road either. Hence the coffee shop. So you know those those are some of the, the thoughts that have gone into. Uh, uh, tenant selection and the overall development. Okay, thank, thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman Hoskins. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just kind of going off of that, and uh, you might have mentioned it, I know we've been talking about the retail spaces in all of the buildings. So in the front building, fronting uh, Evergreen, is that, are we designated that primarily for restaurants or is that going to be, or for any, for any of the buildings, is it the first floor yeah. spaces is just retail period so so uh, I think the the most desired uh, uh, place to be for a restaurant is the most visible mm -hmm. and that's the hard corner of Evergreen and Civic Center so uh, we do uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, or anticipate uh, a, a fairly sizable uh, sit-down restaurant user going into that uh, into that building occupying a fair amount of space on that first floor but I, I would say I anticipate that, based upon what we have on our desk right now, that uh, the building up front is going to be predominantly food, and then your your lesser uh, scenarios, uh, your service-oriented scenarios, are going to take uh, uh, spaces uh, within the interior of the uh, of the development. But your food people, are, uh, your food tenants, are those that pay the most and want the highest visibility and benefit from that visibility. Um, plus, we're doing zero lots, so we're pushing for side seating and, and people want to be where people are so to be able to drive down Evergreen Civic Center and see that there are people there uh, 
sitting in outside patios and, and so forth. Um, it's a hip seat, right? We'll bring that word back and we'll go back yeah. to a comment you made back when, but that's the, uh, that's the idea. People want to be where people are and uh, uh, we want that to be visible and, uh, and uh, open and, and exposed so that we have a, a significant traffic count mm -hmm. uh, that goes through this corridor. Uh, we want to promote that this is, this is live, this is happening, this is a destination. Yes, we are, we are starting to get more hip. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and just so for those, the retail spaces in the back, I'm just curious about, um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking ahead just about their visibility. Um, I'm not sure, depending on the type of, of retail that goes there, I'm just curious if, you know, obviously, just like you said, we want the restaurants to be seen from Evergreen, but those other spaces might not be able to be seen as easily. Uh, depending on, you know, if you're driving, you know, up past Evergreen. So you, you have to know, like, I'm going to the dry cleaner that's there or the whatever that's there. And so any thoughts about those spaces? And, 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 and I still anticipate restaurant, some restaurant use going uh, to, the, uh, to the back of the site because, again, it, it, at least from this perspective, you can't entirely see it, but there is a very Main Street feel uh, to this project, again, running both east and west and uh, north and south. Um, uh, we do have uh, f uh, five stories of building there that I, I would say, you know, if we get a, uh, a marquee tenant towards the back, uh, we can put signage uh, uh, pretty high up that is, because in, in, if you look in, in front of the, the, the multi-story building to the uh, north and you come towards Evergreen through the park and then past the coffee shop, that's all low rise and that's all Intent, that's intentional to, to, to stay visible uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the street. If there is a space that is uh, uh, probably the least desirable retail spaces, it's the building, it's the space behind the, uh, uh, the parking deck, but we actually, uh, uh, we have um, uh, a tenant who is actually interested in that space because they are not a, uh, a food user that requires uh, that kind of uh, visibility, but um, uh, because of our location, 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 location. This is a highly desirable uh, uh, site, even if it's uh, tucked uh, behind that parking deck. Okay. All right. That's the other question. I questions I have. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor. You know, I had another question. So the <clears throat> folks that live in the apartment will park in the parking deck. Um, now in Royal Oak, they charge a uh, garage fee some as high as $75 a month. Are, are your tenants going to have free parking? So we're going through that right now and I think that the general rule of thumb is, is the parking for the tenants is going to be uh, free. But what you see in a lot of the new developments is if you want a preferred parking space or a designated okay. parking space as opposed to pick whatever is available parking space, uh, then uh, you tend to see a charge. Um, I was actually, and I mentioned the, the dot in Ferndale, which is the parking deck on uh, just off of Nine Mile. And I almost called you this weekend because I was driving down Nine Mile and saw all of the stuff that was going on there. <laughs> um, but uh, they charged $1.15 an hour uh, for, the, uh, for the dot in, uh, in Ferndale. And that, was, that parking deck was uh, built in, uh, by the issuance of a bond uh, as well. And it is a mixed use deck. Um, but uh, um, Ultimately, our, I think what our, our objective is in the way that we're laying this out is we want to make the first level of the deck, which would be the ground level of the deck for retail uh, patrons, and then we want to secure and separate the, uh, uh, a number of floors strictly for residents because the idea is, is we want to keep the parking deck uh, secure. We want to have a means of whether it's license plate recognition, uh, or a, uh, a fob uh, that's in your window uh, that uh, we're not intermingling um, uh, retail patrons with, uh, with residents. Okay. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the direction that, uh, that we're going. And those are some, again, the things that uh, we're working behind the scenes that I, I say are those last minute tweaks. And I've, I've done a lot of homework in, in visiting the, uh, going downtown and Punchbowl Social, which is another parking deck that has mixed use on the on the first floor, and 
and just seeing how people are doing things and seeing what works and, and what doesn't work and actually parking in a deck and, and, uh, and seeing what it's like to walk to the destination. And, and so it's, it's kind of fueled a, a lot of different thoughts and ideas uh, with our development. And, you know, the pictures don't always uh, uh, tell the whole story, but, you know, even parking in a, a deck, and you can look across the street at the 5,000 uh, tower, you'll see that if you parked on the furthest end of the deck, you still got a, a, a pretty decent walk to, to, yeah. get to, the, uh, to get to the tower. But um, what we're talking about doing is we're talking about creating parking spaces that are close for residents who can, if you have a trunk full of groceries and you need to run them in so that you're not having to truck them through the parking deck. Uh, I've seen some instances where even some of the collapsible wagons were made available to the residents so that you can put stuff in it and wheel them into your apartment. Well, and yeah, so there's a lot of thought. Thank you. That, um, I, just, I was just curious what your thinking was on that. And um, you don't have to elaborate further, but keep plugging for that gourmet market. We are. It'll be a hit here. And, and I just wanted to add that uh, in some of the renderings that I've seen, like you've mentioned before, it is like a main street no matter where you are on the complex, because Central Park has businesses as well and a lot of students. But um, in my travels, I've also been a part of seeing where restaurants and retails are very close to the parking deck, and they have a lot of business. Mm. I mean, a lot of business. People want walk up yeah. uh, restaurants. So I think keep envisioning. I, I love the passion that you have there, and I'm sure we're going to see something beautiful over there thank you. sooner rather than later. So thank, thank you, you for all of your hard work and everything that's going into this. Thank you. Through the chair, just that, um, could you just um, give us a ballpark on the number of residential units you're proposing? Uh, 450 to 500 uh, units. Uh, we, we actually might go slightly north of, uh, of 500. Um, the, uh, the one thing I'll add uh, as well, you asked me a question to get me going again. Um, the front building has uh, five stories uh, to it. The first floor is uh, retail space. The second floor is intended to be uh, commercial space uh, uh, to be used for uh, co-working uh, space. The uh, three floors above that are going to be uh, 20 units per floor, um, uh, stu studio slash one bedroom type uh, units. The idea that uh, putting residential in that building up, up front is that that will be the building that will be completed first. It will allow us to build uh, models of what the apartments are going to look like in the larger buildings uh, in the rear, and it will also give us an opportunity to do some pre-leasing uh, for, uh, for the buildings uh, in the rear as well. So there will be approximately 60 units uh, uh, up front, um, and then uh, uh, 200 and something odd units uh, uh, per uh, the two buildings uh, in the back, hence the range of, of 450 to 500 units. So I was, what I was trying to do is make a point how many, uh, these are going to be people living there 24-7 that can walk down and patronize the restaurants. Mm -hmm. So if you figure one to two people per unit, that's up to 1,000 people there. Then within an eighth of a mile and even closer, you've got 170 rooms in the Arbor Lofts, not including their new development. Up the street on Central Park Boulevard and 11 Mile, the alcove has a couple hundred, used to be extended stay that's being converted into um, full-time residential, and you have the 5,000 tower condos. These are all within less than an eighth of a mile. If you started adding in Lawrence Tax, 1,000 students, and uh, the people that occupy Evershire and, the, and neighborhoods, there's several thousand people that live right within walking distance. So. That's the kind of density that you need to support these other restaurants and retail operations. Thank you. No other comments or anything? So, we'll so uh, yeah, we're recommending that uh, no action be taken until the October 3rd uh, meeting. The public hearing has been held while we flesh out a few of these last minute details with regard to the parking structure. No. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate your time and your feedback. So we'll be moving on to our next public hearing, which is PZR ODD 22-0002. Yes, thank you. So um, as you stated, PZR ODD 22-0002, Petitioner Friedman Real Estate, 
27400 Northwestern Highway. It's on the north side of Northwestern between Bell Road and Telegraph Road. Uh, existing zoning is B3 General Business and is proposed for the Overlay Development District, which uh, allows for mixed-use development. Uh, conversion of the existing office building into storage with mixed use on the first floor in future phases uh, of a variety of, of types of businesses being proposed. The market will determine ultimately what gets built there, uh, but this is the existing condition. This previous office of um, Plant Moran has been vacant for some time now. Uh, existing conditions on the site and then uh, proposed conversion of the existing building for adaptive reuse as well as two potential out parcel developments on future phases. Uh, this is a configuration of the internal office building with rear access for storage and then some office retail workspace on the first floor. Uh, this is the uh, access this will be the only access to the building for storage will be on the rear or north, north end of the property. Um, some proposed elevation changes to clean up the facility. And then uh, some potential out buildings including uh, medical, assisted living, and a few other renderings, possibly a daycare options for the overall site. Again, um, this is requiring a public hearing, and then I'll be making some recommendations on um, moving forward after the public hearing's been held. Before we go to the public hearing, I don't know if the applicant would like to say anything uh, regarding this or just wait until questions. I believe they'll prepare to answer questions after the public hearing. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to now declare that the public hearing is open. <coughs> If there is anyone here in the audience that would like to speak to this topic, please come forward. Okay, seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. So um, to the council through um, council president, uh, this is another item that we're in favor of moving forward. However, there's been some late um, minute submissions as late as 4.58 p.m. on Friday and earlier today. Uh, I'd like the opportunity to be able to completely vet these changes prior to council taking any action and again would defer um, any action being taken until your October 3rd meeting. Since the public hearing has been held and it'll give us the opportunity to uh, cross the T's and dot the I's, we'll be prepared to make a recommendation for moving forward at your October 3rd meeting. Okay, thank you. Council, do we have any questions for this item? Uh, Councilman Brightwell. Uh, Chair, uh, for all the uses for this, you know, the uh, proposed usages, uh, do we have adequate parking? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, I, I will say yes and, and also say to you that any future phase would, would have a separate site plan review so that on, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, those out parcels will be reviewed individually based on their size, density, and use. So, so based on the cur current configuration, you're approving, you would be considering approving the master development plan for the adaptive reuse of the existing office building, and then in future phases, as the market dictates, they will come back before us for site plan approval. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councilwoman Banks. Um, to Planner Crowd, do these items have to be republished since we're not taking the action tonight? No, um, because we've okay. held the public, public hearing. hearing. Okay. That's what needed to be published. And you could defer action after the public hearing's been held. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor? I'm just curious, how many parking spaces does uh, storage need? Is there, is um, there a minimal, requirement? Minimal spaces, but I, I will defer to that, um, the architect to okay. answer that question. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Stuhlreier with Design House, representing the developer. Uh, 
to answer your question, this facility needs about 20 for operations. Um, yep, as they come and go, they'll get about 15 visits a day. Um, the most occupancy in the parking lot will be during lease up, not during stabilization. Um, so you might have one or two visitors at a time at the most, plus an employee or two. Exactly correct. Could I make a comment, sure. Jerry? Uh, the last minute changes, I don't want to give the wrong impression. These are the legal teams arduously working through the ODD agreement. There's no changes to our design right. that, Thank we, you. that have come in late. <clears throat> Thank you. We have no other questions at this time. Thank you. I, I think, I, I, just to your point though, um, I did receive uh, an updated rendering that shows bollards, and, and that's one of the last minute changes. So I just wanted to be clear, that will be updated in the presentation we for two that. weeks from now. That was published at the final planning commission, and it just never made the package. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this will come back to us on October 3rd. Yeah. Okay. So we can go to our next public hearing, which is the rezoning request. Let me just get caught up here. Okay. ODD 22-0004, mm -hmm. Petitioner Contour Development Group, address located at 21577 Greenfield Road. Uh, this is the Northland Center City Center redevelopment, which was previously approved uh, back in 2021. Since that time, they've been moving forward on their phase one development but they have acquired the former Vibe Credit Union, which was previously the Stouffer Restaurant. Uh, they've added that parcel to their overall development to allow for construction of a 160,000 gross square foot Costco Business Center as part of phase 2A and, and some changes to the roadway and buildings adjacent to the proposed Costco that are now part of phase 1G. The o ODD acreage will now be 100.72 acres. Uh, existing site, this is the area of the proposed Costco Business Center, which I understand will be the first of its kind in, in Michigan. <coughs> and uh, this is the current configuration of the ODD. So if you notice that these areas that are outside the boundary have now been added to accommodate the Costco. Uh, this was the approved plan. Uh, this was always shown as a phase two development. The ODD recognized that there would be likely a big box retail. We did limit it to one, but we capped it at 100,000 square feet. Um, this particular Costco is 160,000 square feet. So one of the amendments that are being considered is increasing the maximum size from 100,000 square feet to 160,000. This was previously, the Vibe Credit Union was outside of the original development. And some of these buildings configuration in phase 1G will change because the road configuration to accommodate the Costco Business Center has changed. Uh, one of the things that we're um, still waiting for an update on, this was the previously approved phasing plan. And again, when you put these things together, it's hard to have a crystal ball to determine 10, 15, 20 years in the future. So now that uh, phase 2A has kind of leapfrogged phases 1B through 1G, we would like to get an updated uh, schedule of the phasing. Uh, this outlines some of the 
specific changes to the ODD agreement, uh, a close up of the proposed Costco Business Center with parking, uh, some road reconfiguration. This road now comes straight through. Buildings L and, I can't read that one, but uh, M um, are, one building has been eliminated, but these have been increased in size to accommodate the changes. And you could see there was proposed row townhousing up here. There was a row that was originally planned in a future phase here that those also will be adjusted as part of the ODD amendment. These are some specific changes from the original building data to the proposed, uh, again, um, a more detailed development plan accommodating the new Costco Business Center site plan which will be part of your consideration tonight and a landscaping plan concept elevations the uh, building design will incorporate the design materials that were approved for the uh, Northland redevelopment city center as well as all the streetscape and periphery shared use pathways uh, stone monuments fencing and ornamentation will all be built consistent with what's um, happening around the entire site. These are some renderings of the proposed facility. And uh, before we open the public hearing, um, the proposed road configuration, when it was uh, the Hudson's property, there was an off-ramp that came right off of Northwestern Highway, single direction, curves in, and then there was upper deck, and then there was a lower deck. This will be reconfigured um, based on meeting the design standards uh, for a public road. There will be uh, easements granted and the roads will be built to a public standard. Because there is an existing retaining wall, there, there has to be some rearrangement of that northern parking area by about five feet to accommodate the width for a two-lane public road. But other than that, um, you know, the, the site plan and uh, the proposed use we're in favor of. So at this time it would be uh, appropriate to hold a public hearing and then unless the um, developer would like to make any statements now or wait until this uh, question and answer period. Okay, thank you. I will now declare the public hearing open for this particular item. If there's anyone here that would like to speak to this uh, Rezoning request, please come forward, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, Greg Keeler. I'm happy to see a Costco moving in our neighborhood. Can't tell you how overjoyed I am as a Costco carrying card member. Um, I just wondered I know there was, and I, and I love the brick wall, because anybody who remembers Northland, that brick wall was the first thing you seen when you came to Northland. Is there going to be the police mini station or something like that in that area? Because of that, not so much as like it is at Sam's Club, but will the mini station be in that area? just because now we have a Costco, now we have the residents in there and everything else so that there is more of a presence that you know that is an area that kind of will deter any, anything from happening over that way. Because I like to see that Costco be a big success in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, for a point of information, can we make sure that the uh, individuals state their address for the public hearing? Yes. yes. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask the uh, representatives of the developer to come up and answer any questions and then I just have a few clarification items um, to make before you take action tonight. 
Good evening, and thank you for having me. My name is Bruce Kopotek. I am chief architect with Contour Companies, uh, 40950 uh, Woodward Avenue in Bloomfield Hills. Okay. Did you want to ask your questions first, Terry, or? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll defer until after council has their. Okay, council. Councilman Brightwell. Clearly, clearly I'm, I'm all for this, but just, just from our daily activity, uh, do we have an estimate of the day, daily uh, visit to this location? Um, I, I don't have it with me, but part of our engineering review, we did complete a traffic study that would have that information, and that's what the engineering department, I believe it's being amended right now. Okay, all right, so, well, okay, so your traffic study took on the consideration the daily activity. Uh, of course we did. Okay. And you know, the right. roads are sized to accommodate that um, egress into the site, and it was really part of a, a major study of that building that involved flipping it around to make um, issues like pedestrian versus delivery traffic um, a safer condition on the site. And we think that we've okay. know, achieved right. a, a plan with the roadways and all that that's going to um, really show that off in the best light to be able to make sure everybody's safe and um, there's not conflicts regarding the traffic amount that's there. Okay, good enough, good enough, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Banks. Um, thank you. What is the size of um, some of the surrounding Costco's that are presently in the area, approximately? Good evening. Uh, typical Costco size of between 125,000 square feet. Okay, so this one's going to be about 150,000? About 160,000. 160,000, okay. And I just wanted to be clear to Mr. Keeler that this is a um, going to be a Costco business center, um, not like the Costco stores we see in the area. I'm not sure exactly 100% what the difference is. It's my understanding that you will be able to utilize it if you do have a Costco membership card, but it will be different than, example, the one on Square Lake, um, off of Schoolcraft, et cetera. So I was just curious about the size. Thank you. Any other questions? Terry? Yeah, so, um, yeah, again, Ms. Banks, I believe from what I heard in previous discussions, uh, a member of Costco can still patronize this store. They just won't have the pharmacy and some of the food items that a traditional Costco. And I believe the Costco's are 125,000 up to 200,000. So this is a, a smaller footprint from a, a mega Costco, but um, many of the similar products will be offered. Bear with me and try to find the right. Uh, all right, so um, from my, my discussions with engineering, as you know, this is an older version of the existing um, off ramp. There's more of a, a 90 degree T intersection that's proposed. And uh, because this road was designed originally as one way and it needs to be built to a two-way public road standard. There's an existing retaining wall that separates the upper level with the lower level. There might need to be a five to seven foot adjustment on Costco's northern property line to accommodate the road um, cross-section required for the public road. We believe that the five or seven feet um, will not have an impact, but since these are our, our smaller trucker parking spaces, we need to double check the uh, turning radiuses of those and to make sure that Costco understands that uh, in this pinch point here, that in order to properly build the public road and not put pressure on the existing retaining wall, if, if that is to be kept and it's structurally sound, engineering's telling me that um, additional five to seven feet will be required. So I wanna make sure that's up front. 
we have received the uh, overlay development amendment agreement. We're still missing an updated phasing plan. We're still missing the exhibit B to the condominium, then it shows the new parcel. All of those things we think um, between the city attorney and myself, we can, we can follow up on um, subject to your uh, conditional approval here tonight. But I wanted to make sure it was clear that those items are still uh, missing and can be easily uh, submitted before the October 3rd enactment. That, that's all the clarification that um, I wanted to make. And if you're ready, I'm prepared to make um, a recommendation. Uh, yes, please. Are you ready? Yes, Okay. Please. So um, we recommend that PZROD 22-0004, the rezoning request of Contour Development Company to amend the existing ODD agreement for Northland Subarea Redevelopment Plan Overlay Development District to allow master development plan and mixed use development and allow for the construction of 160,000 gross square foot Costco Business Center in phase 2A and the changes to previously approved roadways and buildings adjacent to the Costco site be part of phase 1G be approved based on the following reasons. The request amends the previous agreement to cap the large retail building at 100,000 square feet to allow, allow for one large retail building of up to 100, 160,000 square feet in phase two. The amendment realigns the roadway in Northland Drive and modifies residential buildings L, M, and N accordingly. The proposal will be consistent with the surrounding zoning classifications as in accordance with the Southfield Comprehensive Master Plan that indicates downtown development authority sub area for this parcel and is consistent with the Northland design standards and guidelines. The proposed utilizing the Northland sub area redevelopment plan ODD overlay development district provisions and underlying regional shopping zoning will allow the perimeter to market the properties for redevelopment with mixed use land uses compatible with the abutting existing development and will allow for the development flexibility in accordance with the attached amended ODD development agreement. The proposal rezoning will not have an adverse effect upon any of the adjacent zonings or land uses. The petitioners to work with the planning department and the city attorney to finalize the amended Northland overlay development district development agreement. The petitioners to work with the engineering department to finalize the cross section for Boulevard L along Costco's Northwestern property line. Um, and we do recommend approval based on those conditions. Thank you. Council? Madam Chair? Yes. I move that we approve the rezoning request of Contour Development PZR ODD 22 dash 4 Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Hoskins, for the uh, re approval of the rezoning request of Contour Development Company, PZR ODD 22-0004, as presented here tonight. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to introduce ordinance. If, if I could before Mr. Brightwell, it'll be uh, introduce ordinance 1758. Okay. Because we, we skipped the previous two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you want to you do it tonight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I move that we introduce ordinance number 1758. Is there support? Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Hoskins, to introduce ordinance number 1758 for uh, the rezoning request of Contour Development Company. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And so I assume Thank you. I go in sequence here. Mm -hmm. Five, nine. Do we have to Since no, there no, was no, just no. that one. Oh, okay. Uh, so now I'm going to go to the Contour. Nope. We're done. We, what he did is change the number. Okay. Because we didn't use the other two, we're going to now, 
they have to be in order. Oh, okay. We skip. Okay. All right. So okay. Madam Chair, I can now we move to our site plan. Well, we, we still have a couple public hearings. Public okay. hearing D. So our, our next item through the chair is PZTA 22-0003, a council initiated zoning ordinance text amendment to amend Title V, Zoning and Planning, Chapter 45, Zoning of the Code of the City of Southfield, by amending Section 5.22-3, Overlay Development District, Table 1, Permitted Table of Uses of the Zoning Ordinance to allow for EV, Electric Vehicle Research, Testing, Repair, and Maintenance Facilities as a permitted use in the Southfield Technological Corridor District and amending section 5.22-3 subsection B2 prohibited uses allowing EV research testing repair and maintenance facilities as a permitted use in the Southfield technological technology corridor district and any other amendments that may become necessary as needed for the above the text amendment specifically addresses allowing for electric vehicle research testing repair and maintenance facilities in the Southfield Technology Corridor District as permitted use and other amendments that may become necessary uh, within the city of Southfield. So if you recall, when we established this technology corridor, it was supposed to be for research in new and innovative structures. Electric vehicles were still way off in the future, so we didn't anticipate that. In order to allow for the next public hearing to take place, we need to amend the ordinance. And um, we need to hold the public hearing first, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that council may have. Okay, thank you. I now declare the public hearing open for PZTA 22-0003. If there's anyone here that would like to speak to this uh, item, please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Okay, seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Council, do we have any questions? Seeing none, uh, Terry, if you want to. Are you? Yes, I'll um, just give me a minute, please. So, uh, we recommend uh, approval of this text amendment subject to um, the table one and two being updated. Okay, council. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I move that we approve uh, the rezoning request of Tesla Incorporated PZR zero, PZR ODD two two dash zero 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 five as presented excuse me councilman we're still on item d excuse me we're on item d oh mm -hmm. although how did i get <laughs> okay um pzta 22. okay i move that we approve the zoning ordinance text amendment is presented in PZTA 22-0003. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Cruz for the approval of PZTA 22-0003, the zoning ordinance text amendment as presented here tonight. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Our next item would be to introduce ordinance number 1759. Council. Madam Chair, Is I move 61. that we introduce okay. ordinance number 1759. 
Is there a second or support? Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Hoskins, for the introduction of ordinance number 1759 for PZTA 22-0003, the zoning ordinance text amendment. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Our Thank you, Madam Chair. Our final um, public hearing tonight is PZR ODD 22-0005, Petitioner Tesla, Inc., 21375 Telegraph Road, located at the west side of Telegraph between West 8 Mile and Hazelhurst. Uh, existing zoning is Overlay Development District and the proposes to rezone property to ODD with development agreement and site plan for Tesla Inc. EV research testing repair and maintenance facility. Again, um, this is first of its kind in Michigan. I believe the next closest one is Chicago and we're happy to entertain um, this facility in our city. Uh, existing is I-1 industrial, but it does uh, subject to the Southfield Technological Corridor, which you just approved. Uh, future land use is consistent. There's an existing building that will be added on to for their operations. Uh, it's a rendered site plan. Some details here. Interior images. This is not our grandparents' bump shop anymore. A lot of technology is used uh, with computer chips and diagnostics. Uh, these are the proposed elevation improvements and rendering. There will be a new reception area and some additional square footage added to the rear of the property. Uh, these are some of the details. And before we go into the public hearing, uh, we have a representative of Tesla. If you would like to come up and introduce your, your concept and idea here before we take any public comment and be available for questions afterwards. Thank you, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Kayvon Raffi with Tesla, <clears throat> 901 Page Avenue, uh, Fremont, California. What we're proposing here is a re presentation, um, no changes since last presentation, um, of a 34,000 square foot um, uh, building. As part of the scope of work, we'll be adding on, uh, as Terry alluded to, to the rear of the building and as, as well as uh, to the front. Uh, we'll be um, signing the building with our uh, prototypical signage and, um, uh, and also uh, bringing up the building to current uh, zoning standards. Uh, we'll be repainting the entire exterior. Uh, that new addition will be clad in uh, uh, ACM metal panels. Um, and we'll also uh, provide uh, uh, you know, some replacement of the existing metal with EFIS to kind of uh, give it a more modern look. Um, the landlord will also be doing some uh, site plan upgrades as well, um, landscaping, um, path of travel from the main street, um, and uh, I'll open it up to any uh, questions. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. We, we need to hold our public hearing first. Right, okay. All right, uh, you can have a seat, sir. We'll open it up for the public hearing, and then we'll bring you back for any questions. I now declare that the public hearing is open for PZROD I'm sorry, PZROD 22-0005, which is the rezoning request of Tesla Inc. If there is anyone here that would like to speak to this topic, please come forward and state your name and address. Okay, seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. <coughs> Council, do we have any questions? Councilman Brightwell. This this is the same question that I had before. Yes. I'm just trying to get a handle on. I know I know it's a you know typical people come in and get tires changed and do whatever needs to be done to the car, but did you were you able to find out the daily activity is from a quantity standpoint from Chicago. I know Chicago is the closest yes. similar. What, what's the daily kind of activity? Uh, we're looking at uh, a range of 60 to 80 a week. You, you say 60, 60 to, to 80 customers a week. A week? Yes, which will okay. be uh, uh, by appointments. Okay, by appointment. Yeah. So given, given this number, 
you, they are, they are by, by appointment, they are scheduled in. So do you ever, since this is the only one in Michigan, and my dentist, I know he has a Tesla, so I'm sure he'll be coming by there. Uh, you have congestion, you have in any cases, although you have appointments, you know, a lot of things, right. they don't go as planned. Correct. And like when I go to my dentist's office, you know, he's taking longer right. with somebody, so I'm there longer. Right. So do you have cases of congestion or you need anybody there to direct traffic? I'm just trying to figure whether or not we got to expend city resources because of a congestion you have over there. Right. I don't anticipate any uh, congestion. Uh, any, any customer that will want to visit the facility will be by appointment only and that there uh, appointments are done at certain times so that we wouldn't have an influx of customers that overburden the site or the staff. Okay, so um, did you talk to your facility in Chicago to find out what kind of uh, problems they have or did they have any problems or anything that, that, would, that we should be uh, you know, aware of from a, a, a facility operation standpoint? Uh, nothing specific um, to the location of regarding congestion, uh, but this is uh, kind of the information that that's been provided in our uh, use letter. Um, we anticipate for this location um, in the Michigan market, uh, 60 to 80 vehicles a week, uh, which will all be appointment only. Um, there would be uh, appointments would be uh, spread out throughout the day, so that uh, we would alleviate any type of congestion um, that uh, a typical shop may have. Okay. Um, we don't anticipate many or at all, you know, just drive up uh, service or anything like that. Okay. Uh, and if I could, um, through the chair, Mr. Brightwell, you could see that there's uh, ample parking on the site and it also has a long extended driveway. So uh, there's no really concern about congestion or backup onto Telegraph Road. With okay. The way this site is laid out. Okay. Yeah, that's that's one. I know this is a busy street. And I I just know things don't go always go to plan. You know, this is by appointment. That everything I would do is by appointment. But you know, somebody is always uh, you know they're off schedule or something. You sure. know. So. And, and if you, if and you could, this, um, did you say at previous meeting that the average car is ten to fourteen days of service? Uh, anywhere from eleven to sixteen, but based on the number of customers we anticipate seeing in a week, um, that's gonna be like maybe five to eight customers a day. Okay, okay. And no, I, th I think th this is a yeah. good thing for Southfield, and it's a good thing for the customers uh, of Tesla, we're centrally located, so it's, it's good. I'm just trying to get at any foreseeable problems that we mm -hmm. may have, uh, and whatever calls I might get from a standpoint of Somebody saying they, you know, they were had had trouble getting to work because the people were backed up at Tesla, you know, right. or something of that nature. Right. Uh, All right, yeah. Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, seeing none. We'll I'll listen for your recommendations. Yes, um, <coughs> we're making a favorable recommendation um, regarding PZROD 22-0005 to allow for an electric vehicle testing, repair, research, and maintenance facility. Subject to the following reasons, the proposal will be consistent with the surrounding zoning classifications in the Southfield Technology Corridor. The proposal is utilizing the ODD district provisions with underlying I-1 industrial zoning will allow the petitioner to develop the property land for compatible uses. The proposed rezoning will not have an adverse effects upon any of the adjoining zoning or land uses and the petitioners to work with the planning department and the city attorney to finalize the overlay development agreement. Thank you. Council? Madam yes. Chair? Yes. I move that we approve the rezoning request of Tesla Incorporated PZROD22-0005 as presented. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Mandelbaum for the approval of the rezoning request of Tesla Inc. as presented here tonight. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Madam Proceed. Chair, um, we ask that you would introduce ordinance number 1760. Madam President, yes. I move that we introduce um, ordinance number 1760 for approval. Support. Sub it's been moved by Councilman Cruz, supported by Councilman Brightwell for the introduction of ordinance number 1760. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. This concludes our public hearings tonight. Thank you. Next, Council, we will move to our agenda items for discussion and or action. And our first item is the authorization to purchase three life support units or ambulance, three striker power stretchers and power lifting systems, two Lucas CPR devices, and three stair chairs for the Southfield Fire Department. Chief? Yes. Good evening, Council, Madam President. I had a little PowerPoint set up for you to give you a little brief information about um, the, the next four council items before coming up. But um, ha there we go. If you give me one second to set that up. All right, thank you. My apologies for that, um, Council. But I just want to bring your, um, your attention to a couple of things that happened in the fire department. So I, the fire department's identified a need. Uh, the need um, that right now in the last, from 2019 to 2021, there's been a 12% increase in runs. Also, you can look at a 7% increase in the aging population. Uh, the baby, baby boomers right now are taking up about almost 80% of our, of our calls. The strains on individuals, um, having health care issues have 
related to them calling more on 911. 40% um, of our Oakway mutual aid pack, we're taking 40% of those calls right now in the city of Southville, as well as over 7% of our total calls are mutual aid, other, other departments are taking, um, private EM, EMS or other agencies are taking those calls. Right now we're averaging between 1,000 and 1,100 calls per year. And the private EMS system is having trouble staffing individuals, so it's making it harder to rely on them for our backup. So I want to give you a snapshot of what our run volume looks like right now. Um, you can see a steady incline. You do see in 2020, in, in 2020 that there was a decrease. That was due to, to the COVID where we had up to at 10 different agencies running also in Southfield at that time. But also the light of the, the baby boomers. I and mean, I'm saying this is a 54 years of old, really but our 55 to 85 year old um, residents that are in the city. Um, those are the increases that we're seeing each year. Already I'm seeing a 9% increase in our aging population on the run volume. And statistics show right now, um, the EMS journals and so forth that I, that I refer to, um, I use a very conservative number of 24%, but they're saying almost double that. They're saying almost up to 50% that I could see an increase in, in 2023 um, happening right now. Um, like I said, the baby boomers are taking more of the calls because they're aging, they're, they're older, there's more, there's more medical issues that they're having and there's more need, need for that. As I stated, over <coughs> 1,000 calls right now are being, being handled by outside agencies other than Southfield. 30% increase in run volume over the last 10 years. And like I said, the private EMS can't use it. The Oakland County Medical Control is who actually um, is our advisor over in the EMS system and, and the providers. They're stating that your run volume cannot be over 5%. This is a new protocol that just came out this year. I don't know what the penalties are if, if, if we were to go over that 5%, but, there, but now there is a protocol that states about your mutual aid. They want more municipalities to look at covering their, their total calls. When we look at Oakway, this is a snapshot of 2021 of, of all the other departments that are in Oakway, which is covering, um, we know we have um, Birmingham, Bloomfield Township, Farmington Hills, Ferndale, Madison Heights, Rochester Hills, Royal Oak, Waterford, and West Bloomfield. The reason that these are in the Oakway departments because they deliver the same service model as, as the city of Southfield. And as you can see, we took, we received 414 calls last year from mutual aid. We only went and helped others 45. This is a, this is a problem. They, they put me on notice and saying, hey, you're, this isn't mutual um, right now that we have to do something about it. And total calls we're looking at are Redford Township we, we do mutual aid with and also our private EMSs. Currently right now we're at 7% of our total calls. So we're a little, we're over that 5% that threshold of, of what we have. So I always like to give you a snapshot of what our vehicles look like. I believe we have a very good maintenance, pre preventive maintenance and a replacement schedule of, of our vehicles. Um, um, you're gonna hear about me talk about reserve uh, engine two that has a 20, 129,000 miles on it. I'll be looking for some stuff there as well as what I plan to do for the re, um, our, our life trucks. As you can see, even um, we did replace our fleet in 2019, but already life four, 67,000 miles. We're averaging like 30,000 miles per year on these trucks. Um, with the new EPA regulations and how hot these engines are burning, um, they're averaging between 100, they think you're gonna get about 100 to 120,000 miles out of an engine now um, with it. So um, our, my reserve trucks have over 160,000 miles on them. Right now they're 2014s. And with the supply and demand, it's gonna take a while to get some other vehicles um, in here. So this is, a, this is a snapshot of what I have going. So what am I gonna do to try to relieve this? So I'm gonna do a grass, I wanna do a, a, you know, a grassroots effect of, of actually growing our own. I've, We've actually broke, we broke ground. We started this year with our fire academy in the high school, um, that, that's coming. We're, you know, these are individuals that are homegrown. They're already invested in Southfield. They know the streets and, and they'll be, I think, um, individuals that will, will help a lot with, with recruitment. I wanna start a basic life support program. You know, our, our key times that we're busy is from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we can put two more rigs on the road to cover these calls. Like I said, now we're doing almost 14,000 medicals um, in our city, and, and it's the bulk 
of that time. We want to put more, more trucks on the road. It's going to take me a minute to get these trucks. Like I said, I'll, I'll show you in, in the council letters that, you know, one can be available at the end of this year, two more by the, by the fall or end of, of next year. Um, but I want to help take the strain away off, off our mutual aid and stuff that we're offering. So I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of, of what I have and, and why I'm asking for um, these things and why I'm coming to you now um, for those things. Okay, so the first item, did you want to expand? Yes, yeah, so what I'm asking for um, right now is to approve three life support units, three striker power stretcher lift systems, three Lucas CPR devices, three tier, stair chairs for the department. So currently we have seven, seven vehicles. Five of them are the 2019 that we talked about that we just replaced. Two are the 2014s that have averaged 160 miles. I think I've stated that we've seen an increase in between 19 and 21 of that 12% increase in, in run volume as well as our aging population requiring us to do, do more calls. Um, I'd like to also, you know, like to start a BLS program that help take over the, the, um, the increase in call, the call volume, the increased transports and decrease the amount of mutual aid with that. So I like one of these vehicles can be available, like I said, later this year, um, November, December. The other one's at the fall of 2023. The power load stretch is a, is a two-part system. It's a power system that's attached to the truck, and then you have the power, and you have the stretcher that goes with it. The, the Lucas CPR devices, I think um, a lot of you might have seen when you went to fire ops, it's the CPR compression um, that does perfect CPR by, by those, and a stair chair. Anytime the elevator is not available, this is a, a manual device chair that can we can lift patients up and down the stairs safely. Um, so we're looking at the fiscal impact of this is one million one hundred thirty-nine thousand four hundred thirty-eight dollars and one cents. Um, now I said this was included in the in the, the capital improvement plan. The life trucks would be nine hundred and three thousand one hundred eleven dollars. The power load stretchers are one hundred fifty thousand one dollars and eight cents. The Lucas CPR devices is thirty-three thousand. $516.50. The stair chairs is $11,021.47. This includes a five-year prevention maintenance on the, on the CPR devices, the power loads, and the chairs. Um, there's a, a freight of uh, $1,709.86. Tolling, that's tolling one, $1,150,438.01. $1 we would get a credit of $11,000 making the total of, as we stated before, is $1,139,438.01. $120,000 will be taken out of the, the fire life support equipment purchasing department's budget, and the one, and $1,011,938.01 will be talking out of, we're taken out of the equipment revolving fund. Uh, I'm seeking to buy these, to buy these out of, um, from, EV Plus, it's Emergency Vehicle Plus out of Holland, Michigan. It's the same company that we bought the other vehicles from, and we'd be using a, a consortium out of Houston Galveston Area uh, Cooperative. I'm seeking approval for these these items. Okay. Thank you, Council. Councilman Mandelbaum. Thank you, Chief. When when you look at the the run volume and the mileage on the current rigs, do you rotate which rigs out of which station to help? distribute the mileage more evenly? Um, no, I mean, we, it's been pretty consistent over the years at this, that life four, because of the longer transports at the hospital than life two, than life three and life one. Life one pretty much has a 45 minute re recovery time. And, and that is, uh, that is, but they've been outfitted. They're all outfitted the same way, but we don't, the mileage is normally works out by time we want to replace them. And these, these are rigs that we bought that we're going to, Take the box off and, and, and reuse them, right. and and put them on the next on the next chassis is what we, what we did. The the issue has always been getting getting the the chassis. Okay, and then these these new life support units will be located out of which stations? Those are going to be out of Station Five, the main headquarters. Um, the what we plan to do is run a unit out of the north and out of the south is, is what we're, what we're, how we're gonna break the city down. But also we needed, we needed a vehicle. It's about a six, seven month process to remount, 
remount a truck onto the new onto the new chassis. And so we also need with 160,000 on the other trucks, and, and they're eight years old. By the time we get these trucks, they'll they'll pretty much be 10 years old, um, and and so we need a truck to, to, to get in to replace those also. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Cruz. Yes, uh, Chief, I was just wondering if the numbers that you showed here on the runs and everything, th does that include Lathrop? Or yes, yes, sir. That's that part of Lathrop That includes too. Lathrop. Okay, because I know we have that reciprocity that takes place there too, so. But yeah, I'm definitely in favor of this. I think I believe I was on council when you first demonstrated these, uh, what is it, the power stretches? The power load stretches, yeah. yeah they they yeah. really advance, um, you know, quite, I mean, it, it'll lift 750 pounds. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah. it was, it was, you know, I remember when you when you guys first pulled it out, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. And so, and I also just want to commend you and all the force for everything you do. Um, I get compliments all the time about the fact that you know that, you know, fire, EMS, and all that, everybody always on time, just gets there as soon as they call. So um, I just want to just share that with you, that those are comments I'm getting from residents all the time. Thank you. I'll make sure I pass that down to the men and women. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilman Brightwell. Chief, in your write-up, there's, there's something that says starting a B as in Bravo, LS program. What is BLS? BLS, basic life support. Okay. Yeah, so we have a lot of um, calls that don't necessarily need to be in advance. We, we may not need a to do a 12 lead EKG. They may not need drug intervention. Um, so a lot of those calls that we've, we've we found and when we, when we looked at the overall plan and the risk management is that um, these BLS trucks could cover a lot a lot of those type of calls that that we that we receive that don't necessarily need advanced procedures okay all right um and obviously ever, ever since my ride around when i first got on council i saw the need uh, we i just when i realized that the, the why well, well, i mentioned it to the people the two ems guys i was riding with we left that morning and i never got back to the station because we were so busy um and that they were trying to carry a big guy to two of your younger firefighters. And so the equipment that you're purchasing obviously is beneficial to the uh, health and safety of the citizens, but it's health and safety, health and safety of your employees, of your, of your men and women who are working for you. So I'm supportive of this. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Council, ready for a vote? Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to move the authorization to purchase three life support units, three striker power stretchers and power lifting systems, two Lucas CPR devices and three chair, three stair chairs for the Southfield Fire Department. Support. support. It's been moved by Councilman Mandelbaum, supported by Councilman Brightwell for the approval to of the authorization to purchase the three life support units and other equipment as presented here tonight for our Southfield Police Department. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next. Thank you. I'm next. I'm seeking authorization for additional repair expenditures for the re uh, refurbishing of our 2002 Sutphin um, ladder truck. Um, back in December 13th of 2021, Council gave us approval to refurbish this vehicle for $102,596. Uh, once the truck was being disassembled, other repairs were, were needed. Um, we needed an engine starter, hydraulic pump. There were broken wells on the front and rear axles. Um, we had, we had um, seized brake calibers. We, we had to weld some brackets, lights, and broken compartment doors. Um, these um, expenses added up to uh, $41,644.10, and we would, we would, we were, we're seeking the fiscal impact of that would be taken out of the equipment revolving fund. Um, I'm here to seek additional funds to um, finish the refurbish on the 2002 Sutphin aerial tower truck um, and let Apollo Fire Equipment Company out of Romeo, Michigan can finish, finish with their repairs. Um, repairs should take about 
um, six weeks. I did get a call this morning, and there's a delay on, on, on some parts, but um, that's just the nature of the business right now. But I'm seeking authorization for the additional $41,644.10. Council, do we have any questions? If none, um, Madam Chair. Yes. I'd like to move the authorization for additional repairs to refurbish the 2002 100 foot aerial tower truck. Support. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Mandelbaum, supported by Councilman Cruz, for the approval of the authorization for the additional repairs to the refurbished 2002 Septon 100 foot aerial truck, tower truck as presented here tonight. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Item number three. Thank you. Um, this is authorization to purchase new structural firefighting turnout gear. I'm seeking to, to purchase 139 new sets of structural firefighter gear. This will give each firefighter two sets of firefighter gear. Um, NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safe and Health, um, conducted a study that showed that found that significant high risk of firefighters um, with cancer and, and dealing with carcinogens. Uh, the synthetic materials that are, are currently being used in, in building stuff and that they experience in, in fires are, are saturating their gear. Um, the National Fire Protection Agent, Agency, who sets the standards for the fire service, recommends that any time that the gear has been exposed to these carcinogens, that it should be washed in, a, in an extractor. Um, so therefore, they would need a, a second set of gear, and this is the best practices for, for the fire service. Um, the fiscal impact of this purchase is $498,019. Um, this, I'm requesting that we, we, we a lot this money was out of the American Rescue Plan grant funds. Um, so it, it averages out to be about, a, a, it's a little over $3,500 $3, per sets of gear. Um, I'm seeking for, to buy this from Phoenix Safety Outfitters out of Springfield, Ohio. Um, this is being made without a competitive bid. We're contracting with the NPP dot, um, Government Purchin Purchasing Consortium. I'm seeking approval to purchase 139 new sets of firefighter gear. Council, Council Brightwell. Chief, uh, if each gear, and, and each, each, each person will have two sets of gear, so, are these assigned to these individuals for life? Let's just say if this individual re retires or goes to another uh, city as to, to work, is that gear still usable by our remaining um, staffing or does, does the gear need to be torn, thrown away? No, the, um, the gear, the best standard uh, now, gear should be taken out of service after 10 years of use. Um, so, you know, once they go to a fire, I mean, especially in the winter time, the gear is frozen, it, you can't even bend it, that they have another set of gear that they can, they can get into. But we do not give them the gear once they retire. We repurpose the gear. And if it's um, sometimes older, we sometimes donate it or we, we sponsor individuals to go to the fire academy so it gives them a break on their tuition that they don't, they don't have to um, they don't have to uh, encumber that that, okay. that expense. So if it's was still within the ten-year useful life, uh, theoretically, would we keep it for active duty for our current people? Yes, but you know it all depends on the size. You know, I mean, it's yeah. the the gear is custom fitted for for each firefighter. But long as we 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 have a, or find another firefighter within their range, sure. yes, we repurpose the gear. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Madam no Chair. Other questions? I'm ready for a motion. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. I move that we authorize the purchase of new strikes of. Uh, I, I move that we authorize the purchase of new structural firefighting turnout gear as presented. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Mandelbaum to approve the authorization to purchase new structural fight, firefighting turnout gear. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And your next item, please. Okay. Seek an authorization to purchase a new engine for reserve engine number two. Uh, currently, this is 2009 fire truck reserve engine. 
It has 129,927 miles. Uh, was sent out to Cummings uh, Sales and Service in New Hudson, Michigan for white smoke coming from the exhaust. It was diagnosed as a total engine failure and it needs a complete engine um, replacement. Um, the, you know, this, this w truck was not sent uh, to any other dealer because it uh, had to be reassembled and, and actually towed to another facility, which was approximately about $2,000. Um, Cummings has done a lot of work for the city and the, you know, as the fire department in the past, and um, we've, we've had great success with them. Um, the fiscal impact um, of this is $49,612.38. Um, we're looking to take this out of equipment revolving fund. They offer a one-year warranty on labor and parts. Um, and we're seeking to let um, coming sales and service out of New Hudson, Michigan, uh, do a total engine uh, repair on this engine for $49,612.38. Council, do we have any questions? Nancy, uh, Councilwoman Banks. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, what is the price for a new engine? That is, an, I'm sorry, oh, that, I'm sorry, that is a new engine. Um, oh, so we're not repairing what's there, we're getting a brand new engine. Correct. Okay, thank yes, you. Anyone else? Okay, Council, are we prepared to vote? Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to move the, the authorization to purchase engine repair for reserve fire engine two for the fire department. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Mandelbaum, supported by Councilman Cruz to approve the authorization to purchase the engine repair for reserve fire engine number two for the fire department as presented here tonight. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Our next item is the authorization to retain OHM advisor with uh, Quinn Evans to complete the phase one improvement plan for the municipal campus facility. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> this evening, the administration, as you've indicated, uh, we've uh, presented to council a proposal from OHM advisors in, in conjunction with Quinn Evans, uh, and we are requesting authority for the mayor and city clerk to execute a contract for the municipal campus facility phase one improvement plan uh, to OHM uh, of Livonia in the amount of 263,000 with funds available in the general fund. Um, account as indicated in the write up. Red Grandevelt from OHM is here. This item was, recommend, was uh, discussed several times with the finance committee and last at their meeting two Fridays ago, it was recommended that this item be forwarded to full city council for your approval. We've outlined uh, a scope of work that focuses primarily on our uh, municipal campus, in particular the city hall proper building, the parks and rec building, the muddy boots building, and the pavilion, which we in the diagram have indicated as buildings um, uh, 11, uh, 15, and 16 um, are, are the buildings of our initial focus. The, uh, if, if Mr. Uh, Grandevelt could uh, come forward and uh, help uh, along with this presentation at this point, we've outlined the scope of work, which uh, consists of the uh, conditional uh, assessment, code compliance review, structural assessment, site assessment, safety and security assessments, and space utilization. If council recalls, we did uh, initially engage this project in 2019. The report was completed just as COVID was breaking. Um, the report does a review of our space utilization, uh, in particular recognizing the impact of COVID. It also recognizes some of the most recent, uh, the members of the finance committee have spent a whole lot of time touring other recreational facilities, in particular looking at indoor pools. Uh, we hope to factor that into the equation as well. As council's aware, the last uh, three years you've built a fund reserve of about 16 and a half million to start this process of what our facilities will look like. And if Brett could 
come to the podium and I'll be at this microphone. Uh, good evening, Council. If I could, I'd also like to invite uh, Brandon is with uh, Quinn Evans Architects. Sandra Evans was out of town this evening and so uh, she was unable to join us, but Brandon is here as well. He would be uh, lead architect, project manager for the effort. Um, just, I guess just to piggyback on the introduction given by uh, Administrator Zorn, uh, this really builds off of the condition assessment, uh, facility assessment, comprehensive assessment that was done in 2019 um, and focuses in at the, uh, the, the primary buildings surrounding the pavilion as the first phase of investing uh, or helping the city plan an investment in, uh, um, in the infrastructure and the facilities. Um, we uh, have the steps that are in here are to revisit some of the usage of the facilities. We did do that in 2019, but the organization has continued to evolve in the last couple of years, and certainly the impact of the COVID situation has changed how all organizations interface with their customers and maybe even a little bit of how the workspace uh, could be imagined. So we would intend on revisiting those assessments with all the department heads. Um, and then really start to imagine, reimagine the space and prioritize where the investment would go. Uh, one task in here did um, uh, identify that we would work with the city's procurement team. Uh, the belief and recommendation is that ultimately when we get to the point of, of uh, delivering this work, it would be in the city's best interest to consider the use of a construction manager. Um, given the economy, the, the uh, renovation of existing space, the challenges with uh, um, cost estimating right now in the construction world, we just really feel that would be uh, advantageous for the city. So we've included a, a budget in here to work with the procurement team right out of the gate uh, to try to help the city uh, go out on the street and solicit for um, qualifications for a professional CM um, that would work with us on the tail end of this to start uh, putting actual budgets and cost estimates together and, and really a phasing implementation plan because that'll, that'll be critical for how you can do it and still um, meet the needs of your customers today. So maybe I'll, I'll stop with that as a high level overview and help answer any questions that might come up. Thank you. <clears throat> Council, do we have any questions? Um, Councilwoman Banks? I just want to make sure, because I know it's not listed on the first page where we have the yellow highlighted area, that the pool is definitely considered in this. And I thought we had an outline in the finance committee that listed um, the pool situation. And in the write-up, it says that the, um, where is it? That they, you may consider replacing it. Um, and I just want to make, just want to confirm, because I don't see it in here, that the pool is part of the study. Is that correct or no? Uh Sure, I can, I can just add to clarification. We did include a task in here. Uh, the, uh, the city, uh, through the facilities, or the uh, finance committee, I believe, went and toured some recreational facilities uh, in southeast Michigan and have a sense for the size and scale of a facility that the city might want to consider. And so we included a task in here to look at the feasibility of how, that, how a facility of, a, of, of that size might fit into the municipal uh, city center campus and specifically whether it might uh, fit into the north side of the pavilion where the existing parks and rec uh, building uh, uh, sits and, and how that might interface for access and uh, whatnot with the public. So there's not a, a detailed study of what a recreational facility might cost, swimming pool. It was really to take the, the uh, a similar size facility that you guys felt might uh, might fit with the city of Southfield and try to see how it would fit um, on, onto the site to inform city council about whether it's a it's a future project they might want to undertake and could afford. I thought we were going to do both. If we get, I thought we were going to do both. I mean, if they say yes, it could fit on the site, but we don't know approximately what the numbers were going to be. I thought that was included in the study. Yeah, I, I think, defer to yeah. the council chair. Yeah, I think. I mean, to the um, finance chair. Excuse me. I think we uh, indicated by based on the fact that we visited seven facilities uh, in the metro area that we were looking at definitely replacing the pool that is that we currently have. Now, whether or not that will be a standalone pool 
or a recreational center that was to be determined uh, by council. But initially, right now, I think we 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 want OHM to determine where we can put a pool that's comparable to what we currently have, and that's a given. We don't have a pool. We will we replace that pool. That that's a given. That's that, that's a that that has been been determined by the finance committee and also by I think by this committee we will be replacing that pool. But in what form it will take, whether or not it will be a recreational center or a standalone pool, that needs to be determined uh, by council and also by our ability to pay. And that's and that will be a driving factor, our our ability to to pay for what we want. And we haven't determined we haven't determined yet what we want and that that was a part of the process of visiting the various uh, municipalities and looking at their facilities. So, but uh, a part of your mission now, Brett, you will be determining where a location of a uh, uh, rec center and or pool, is that correct? So, so at the uh, uh, finance committee meetings, I know parallel to this comprehensive facilities improvements, the topic of how to replace the pool and whether the pool turned into a larger recreational facility certainly was talked about. One of the questions asked was, well, how might that future plan impact any intentions to renovate some of the existing facilities, i.e., if the, if the parks and rec space that they occupy today was going to get incorporated into some new facility, then it wouldn't make sense to necessarily invest in that. So what we've talked about in this scope of work was to see whether it made sense to um, place a future facility of a certain size for recreational purposes. What might be in that as far as pools or other amenities are not necessarily envisioned here, but whether that would fit in the space currently occupied uh, by either the, the pool uh, and or the existing parks and rec facility. I do believe, and I'm looking to Administrator Zorn, but the, the, the uh, scoping and design and costing of what a recreational facility, including all the various amenities that might be in there, is, is something that would, would come under a separate, uh, uh, separate scope of work that Parks and Rec might be considering in the future. Right. That wasn't my understanding. I, that wasn't my understanding, but maybe I'm... No, 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 I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree thought that's you. why we were bringing this whole thing forward, to have that also part of it. Yeah, we want because we wanted to get information on the pool as well. We, that was part of the conversation I, that from the meeting that I sat in on. That that was going to be a part of this, in addition to everything that you're saying. But we also wanted to look at that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the way I remembered it. As I understand the scope of work, we are evaluating the scope of work. For, the, for the, these buildings, and that will include looking at the recreational component we have at it. The recommendation of Parks and Rec as we toured these, the pools and the facilities when they were combined had the best synergy. There was a general consensus regarding the Romulus facility. And if you happen to lay that Romulus uh, facility, and I've had GIS take those areas on the north end of our existing rec building, you, and you cut into the um, loading dock area some slight modifications, that could work. I also know the, that staff has had some recommendations that maybe there's something on top of the existing pool or just the uh, north side of the ice arena. Obviously, if there's something that happens on the north side of this campus, then it becomes part of what we're doing with cleaning up the 12 elevators we have, cleaning up and ensuring that the pavilion itself is functional. Um, but there could be enough renovation work. If you're familiar with the lower level of what happens in the basement of, of be beneath the rec center, that's your carve out area of the pool. And if you looked at what we liked in the pools, it was the lazy river, it was three to five lanes for laps for mm -hmm. lap swimming. Mm -hmm. um, I want to caution, there was a statement of something the same size of pool we have. We have a massive pool. 
everything we saw in Livonia, Romulus, even Farmington Hills, those pools were much smaller than what we have in our existing pool. But, but going back to what Nancy was saying, when we, we asked, in addition to finding a location, we also wanted at the same time someone to be looking at having a pool actually being done. Whichever pool, and we did say the things that we wanted, the lanes, the lazy river, and all of that, the splash. We did say what we wanted that pool to right. look like. But we, uh, th my understanding was they were supposed to be doing both, finding a location and looking at. That, that's my understanding of the scope of work. And, and I guess I just want to be, um, be clear because there was a lot of conversation at some of those finance committee meetings about the recreational facility. We've budgeted time to look at fitting a facility that you guys are going to help us based on your tours, what the cost would be, how it would fit into the site. S studying the preliminary design of a recreational facility and all the amenities that you might want to put into it, which w what amenities are the right for the city or not. We, we've, I mean, that, that's a separate design scope that we've not included in this proposal right now. We certainly could come back to the city and, and add effort to do that. There are experts out there that specialize just in, in that type of design work. We, we were from those committee meetings understanding that the, the, uh, the city would say, we liked this facility that we toured here, here, and here help us understand how much that would cost and what it would fit, you know, how it would fit into our, uh, our municipal complex. But to start designing a recreational facility or putting effort into preliminary design is, is, is something that would be outside of what's currently in here. And I don't want to mislead uh, council and, and have you expect that at the end of this you'll have a, you know, a, a rendering or a cost estimate or something of a, of a rec center. Yeah, Madam Chair, if I can, because, uh, <sighs> Oh, okay, one thing is for certain that the Finance Committee, we will be getting a new pool. Now, there's, there's something that is going, this, the purpose of this study is to start work on that need assessment, that $265 million project, you know, renovating this, this whole campus, or renovating what came out of that study. And that, that's what's to get you started on that, but we will, we threw into there uh, the bit about a location for a pool. Now, the facilities, that should be something that's being parallel going on right now. Parks and Rec be making input of what their suggestion is. Council made a suggestion what their, what, what our thoughts are. So that will become, come to you from a, from a design standpoint. This is what we finally want. But I want, I understand what Parks and Rec is going, they're doing something looking at what is ideal. We have already, gave us, uh, through the finance committee, we produced our top items that we want to see in these pools and what a pool should be. So that is, uh, and I do recognize that we have to tell you specifically what we want in a location, a pool, whether that will be a pool only or a recreational center. So that, that, that needs to be determined. Now, where that is placed, and I think you can tell us what we can place on this campus, what we can place on this campus given, given what we have, uh, you know, the, the space available. But we definitely want a pool. That's a given. The pool, pool will be replaced. And what, what configuration or what it looks like, that, that has to be determined by this council, parks and rec, Input, I, it's my understanding Parks and Rec is doing something, looking at some things, and we've already made our input what we like when we made our visit to these seven locations. Now, what that gets down to, I don't think it gets down to what, what we're finally doing. But the reason, my, my reason for having OHM here is to start on this $265 project to get this campus uh, retrofitted or updated or make, you know, space, what do we need to do to start the, uh, start the uh, getting away at this capital improvement of, the, of this campus? So is it, does that make sense that the fact that we will be replacing the pool, that, that's a given, that, that is pretty much we got that from a consensus of this council, that, that has to be, and I know Parks and Rec is doing something here on that. 
and I have talked about sending a survey out to the community, a real good survey, of, of not, well, not one of these little five or 10 responses, but a real good professional survey with a, with a plus or minus one, to one or 2% accuracy uh, on, on this pool so we can really get what the, what the citizens want. And so now, and, and, and that's, that's my understanding from the science committee when we started working it and that's why we took that tour. The pool, we will get a pool and that's a given, but what that, what, how is that configured, that is to be determined. Okay. okay. Uh, Mayor, did you want to add? Um, perhaps I missed something, but I don't recall um, that OHM was charged with creating the pool. Is that the plan? No. You're, are they charged with what? Charged with designing the, the pool. No, it's not designing the pool, but part of this will evaluate where the box basically could sit. Oh, okay. And, I, I, you know, and that's where, you know, again, I, I think relative to design and elements people want to see, I didn't bring the, the folder with me, but we've got all of the prioritization of council. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. members who toured all those facilities, you put that time in, you marked what you liked, what you didn't like. I'm going to go out on a limb. There was a general consensus that if we took pretty much that Romulus facility and found that a place for that box, mm -hmm. and what happens inside of it is kind of a detail that would be a byproduct of more intense survey. Mm -hmm. uh, I have said, and looking at some of the things that OHM has done in Detroit and some of these grand, these phenomenal parks in recent years, they tend to do very focused study. What I'd said is. Each council person pick a couple people, and that's your group to focus in what the community wants to see. But I, I look at the investment that we made in those tours, and council, you, you've developed a nice matrix of the elements you want to see, what you liked, what you didn't like, and um, but I think that's a little bit further down the road once we determine where the basic boxes are going to be. I mean. We, we know you're probably looking at, I, I forget the square footage, I wish I'd have brought my full file, but I got the aerial of that, the Dearborn facility, what we saw on the points, uh, Livonia, I mean, it's that basic area, and it's gonna probably come down to three places. North of this, you know, we're the, on top of the existing rec building, on top of the pool or north of, of the ice arena when you look at this municipal campus. Okay, right. so I, I understand that more or less this OHM is going to be engineer, doing the engineering, the, the probability or likelihood of where it could go. And, and re the, uh, the other part of the work is reevaluating Southfield post-pandemic. I mean, the first proposal had us cutting our space by 25, 30%. The day in this pandemic world, the corporate America is rethinking about how we use our, our space. That's a part of this too. Well, everybody's got to get back to work as far as I'm concerned. But, but I, everyone's not going to come back to work in, on top of each other the way yeah, we were in the exactly. past. Exactly. Right. So, uh, so if I, I, if I may continue. So my issue, and I think this is where Councilwoman Banks is going, we got a lot of feedback about the pool and the disappointment that it closed. And I have told people as tactfully as possible that this, there isn't gonna be a pool next year. Uh, and I think we need, all of us need that information uh, because this, is, this issue is not going away uh, with, with the citizenry. Um, and I think if, if we just put it up front that um, uh, this is the plan and we're working towards it and this is the, completion, the expected completion date, I think we'll be better off. It's about communication. Um, there are people out there that are thinking, we're gonna have, a, a, this is just a one year closure. And, I, and I've heard that and it's, it's not true. Um, and then the other issue is, 
is this going to be a year-round facility? And that we heard that over and over again, that we want um, not, it's just so, it's so impractical the way we've run this pool from late June to mid-August because the college kids are the lifeguards, so we closed the pool. And yet, the other day, over this weekend, it had been great to go swimming. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it was in the 80s, it, it was beautiful. And every year, uh, you know, we, we maintain that pool, we fill it with water and, and all of that, and it's open maybe eight weeks. It, do, it doesn't make sense. So uh, I just want to make sure that that is part of whatever comes out of all of this, that um, we're all informed because we, we're getting hit up about what are you doing? And so far, we don't really have, I know work has been done, but there's really not enough to share with the public at this, at this point. So thank you for my. And, and Mayor, you hit on the very, very important part that we kept bringing up in the finance meeting and every other meeting is communication. We brought up the fact that we have a beach woods, a parks and rec, a master plan, and everything else. And we wanted to know how all of that was going to be working together because a lot of the things that we were talking about for this complex was carried over or brought up in those other plans. And we said we didn't want Parks and Rec going off doing something that Beachwoods was over here doing or City Center. We wanted everybody to be informed as to what was going on. And that's when we brought up about the pool. We know that you were looking at where on the site if it's going to be on this site, where it's going to be. But at the same time, we also needed to know how and what kind of materials we even went into, you know, the venting and all this other stuff. Someone is supposed to be looking at these things simultaneously. And I don't know now hearing what I'm hearing is that that's not happening. And so that's where I'm confused a little bit. Could, could I provide a couple of additional comments? I, the, this scope of work, um, as several of you know for, through the finance committee, has evolved a little bit since uh, I think we've been meeting about once a month since uh, May or June. The, the bulk of this effort, 90 some percent of the time that is budgeted here, is focused at the three, this building, the pavilion, the, uh, the Muddy Boots building, and the uh, Parks and Rec building, and moving ahead with the recommendations that were in the 2019 comprehensive needs assessment to start reimagining those spaces, addressing all the ADA issues, the elevator access issues, life safety issues, et cetera. So that's, that's the bulk of this. In, in the middle of those conversations, the question about the pool replacement and the rec center had come up. And so we had added a task in here to, to look at the rec center that you've started to imagine as a group, how and where it could fit on the, on, on, onto the campus. Mm -hmm. In my mind, the, the number one thing is if for some reason it starts to evolve and it looks like it's going to fit into a space that we then might have to tear down a building, then obviously that would influence the renovation plan. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we, we've not budgeted a significant effort to start preliminary design work or you know, r really imagining the details of what that rec center would look like. We'd be happy to, to continue to work with the facilities or the finance committee or whoever to add more uh, uh, scope to that. And I think we've got enough in here that we can come back with some meaningful uh, ideas about where it would fit and with the construction manager get cost estimates. But that, that's, a, that's a design effort in and of itself that I, I actually thought I understood the Parks and Rec Department was working on a separate solicitation to potentially engage someone to do that. So, Councilwoman Banks. Uh, my understanding that Parks and Recreation was working more on the beach woods. And I hope I haven't overstepped my boundaries, but we, because we're probably not going to have a pool next year it has been told to us that the feasibility or the possibility of a splash pad at Beachwoods is very high. So I've been telling people, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, we will probably have a splash pad next year at Beachwoods. Um, and I thought that's where Parks and Recreation was focusing. Um, they even mentioned at one of our meetings that this new footprint 
if we do do an indoor facility, maybe that's where all their offices would be moved. So I personally thought the whole parks and recreation portion was going to include the pool area. And if not, I'm going to say right now, I'd, I'd rather hold off to make sure that it's included in this because the comeback later, we're just postponing, postponing, postponing. And I just think it's really important that we need to move forward with the pool. And it, it, to me, I don't see it in the, the scope here. Kind of sort of mentioned. And it's important. I don't want to promise anything here tonight that, that right. isn't in here. That we've not, this, this, is, this is not beginning the design of a recreational facility. We'd be happy to continue to do that. What I would say is this, this has been on the, on the discussion point for quite some time to try to start the planning of the investment in this facility. And, and we could, whether the council wants to move ahead tonight with this or not, it obviously is up, up but, to you. But we could add additional tasks specific to the recreational facility. The bulk of this is, I mean, the, the bulk of the effort really is in this building. This was the highest priority one to start renovating the, the, uh, the needs of the, the uh, engineering Muddy Boots building are actually a little bit less um, uh, priority than this one, but th the bulk of the effort is in trying to reimagine um, uh, this building, and then we're going to look at the uh, feasibility of the recreational facility center. But, but don't okay. you first need to know where the basic box can yes. fit? I mean, if you don't have that element, I mean, because if it, if it doesn't fit the north end, if it doesn't fit on the pool, it doesn't fit on the north end of the ice arena, where we've, we've got to figure that out, a place for it to physically sit. And that's we, in here. That, 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 that is that's in what, here. That's what we have and in here. Okay. That is in here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay, got it. okay. And, and again, I'm going out on a limb, I really think from what I heard and when I looked at all the evaluation, we could certainly, Folks liked everything in that Romulus. There was some bathroom redesign. Mm -hmm. That we all went, That was the bulk of the, of the feedback. So, yeah. okay. Um, I want to just bring this back to focus. I mean, um, the finance committee started this need assessment in 2019. We finally got a need assessment. And about three or four months ago, the Parks and Rec director told us our pool is dead. We got to start renting space. So I said the finance committee would take a look. Now, this is a parallel thing. This need assessment was going down the pipe. It's $265 million mm -hmm. going down the pipe. I wanted to get it started and because this is a 10 to 15 year project and we want to start fixing this campus and all the needs that popped up in, in, in the study. So the finance committee undertook and, and that night when Terry provided us that we might want to go in and get a brand new pool, and I said the finance committee will start looking at it, looking at it initially from a finance standpoint. Can we pay for this? So we got the finance committee decided let's start looking, going, taking a trip to several places that were suggested, and these were some ideal places. In each one of them, we got suggestions of what looks good, what to do and what not to do. So that, that is one parallel, that's one, one click. The next click of it is what can, what, what does the citizen want? We want to do a survey that, on what the citizens want. A pool will definitely, we would definitely made a pool because we made a decision every city should have a pool. So Southfield will have a pool was a function of when and what it will look like. Now, whether or not this is a, a recreational center or standalone pool, that has to be determined. Now, another thing that's going on here that, that popped up, that the school board has also popped up and said they want to do a recreational center. So that, uh, and Mr. Zorn was going to meet with them, but I understand they're coming here next month so we can discuss that with them. So there's a lot of things that need to be parallel with respect to do, is the school board, if their millage is approved, do we go ahead and do a full recreational center? Can we do all that, spend that money? Does that make sense? So that, but the first thing that needs to be done, now the, the comprehensive need assessment facilities needs to be done. We need to start going down the pipe and getting these getting this campus fixed and retrofitted. And 
the pool will be a part of a parallel functioning within the city with the Parks and Rec pulling their stuff together. I understand Parks and Rec is looking at a pool. Now, I know we, we're doing a splash pad. That, that's a given. The splash pad is going to be taken care of over at the beach. That's not has nothing to do with the pool. But the pool will be done. It might be a parallel once we decide what we what it should look like. We don't know what we want it to look like. And, and we're not asking OHM tonight to go on a start up and go out and design a pool for it because we don't even know what we want yet. Other, other than the fact we get five of us gave our top items, this is what appealed to us. That's not a consensus of the uh, council. So I <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say is that the pool will be built, but we are at a stage right now, we are in the very preliminary stage of building a pool because we have not come to a consensus what that pool will look like uh, and whether or not it's going to be a recreational center or just a standalone pool. But we did, we did get a consensus that it will be covered and it will be year-round. It will be a year-round. That, that came out of the Finance Committee. It will be covered and it'll be year round, so that, that will, but. So, so we could bring this to a close. I think what I heard, and I, I really appreciate you clarifying that, is we're talking two separate things, but what, for tonight, what we're asking is for the approval for OHM to look at the entire facility and tell us if the footage that we came up with, if it would fit on this campus somewhere and where that someplace would be not necessarily what is going to go into the building, but what, if we want, where would it go on this campus, if I'm understanding you correctly. The conversation on the pool we will have again at a later time. That's not what we're here tonight to talk about. It's more of to give you the approval to look at the facility and tell us where this rec building, if we decide to have that here on campus, where would it fit? I think that's a great summary, Madam President. Um, and we're going to use some of what you've already learned in your uh, exploration of other comparable facilities to say, hey, it's going to be something like this, this size, this scope, and come back and be able to just say this is where it would this is where it fit, whether it's on the existing location or some of the other ideas of where to, because uh, I mean, the, the campus is, is still that campus setting where you're trying to share parking and access and have a lot of complementary uses off each other, so. Okay. I'm clear, and I don't know, did, is, is that clear for everybody that we're talking two different things, two separate things, I shouldn't say different. We're all talking the same things, but two separate things. For tonight, though, what they're asking is if they could have the authorization to review our campus. And they, I know they were bringing up other things like Treasury and uh, all the other areas, Parks and Rec, and if the offices is best fit. Even the council chambers were brought up in, I believe, one of the conversations. But now you're we asked you to include that rec building to see where it will fit on this campus, if it will fit. <coughs> Am I correct in stating that? You, you, are, you are correct. Okay. The bulk of this is renovating these, uh, is starting the plans to renovate these okay. buildings and consolidate. There were recommendations in the 2019 study to start moving some of the um, uh, groups into different spaces and consolidate them to ha have them interact better with each other. Um, in, interact better with the public, upgrade security, safety protocols. This, this room is one I know has been a subject of a lot of discussions and some plans put in place. So all, that's the bulk of this, of, of this effort. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So council. Man, sure. Just, just uh, I don't have any questions on, on what was presented um, in this item. My question is, more of a comment based on the discussion we had is that there seems to be a lot going on in subcommittees yes. that the rest of the council is not aware of. That's correct. And I think that before we start having conversations in, in public or a, about items and what's being discussed and what the council has agreed on or, or has asked for, I think the entire council should be included in some of those discussions as well. Mm -hmm. We agree. Yep. Yep. And and yep. if I could say, not to keep it off, it is the, the finance committee will be making monthly or periodic reports to the full council that came out of the, 
the Finance Committee to, have, be, to keep everybody informed. But this is just job one, getting this thing off the road. Okay. Thank you. So, Council? Madam, Madam Chair, Morgan? I'd like to make a motion. <coughs> I'll make a motion that we authorize the city to retain OHM advisors with Quinn Evans to complete the phase one improvement plan for the municipal campus facility. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Brightwell, supported by Councilman Cruz for the approval of the authorization to retain OHM advisor with Quinn Evans to complete the phase one improvement plan for the municipal campus facility. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, if I can say one thing. Yes. Um, and this, this was in place before the pandemic. Uh, but I'm kind of glad that we are taking it up now because the pandemic rearranged and reorganized how businesses are, uh, are operating now. And we can probably, with, with the space utilization of our architect and OHM, we can, all the space utilization, we're going to be, be getting into modern space utilization for all our facilities and all our, all our uh, things that we do here at the city. And so the pandemic probably helped us out from a standpoint of making sure that we are current with how best to space utilize our space for the benefit of all our citizens. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, okay. I, I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay, now we come to our council portion. And I'll start with you, Mr. Hoskins. I, I have nothing to add this okay, evening. Thank you. Mr. Brightwell? Uh, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cruz? I have nothing this evening. Thank you. Ms. Sainz? There's nothing this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And I have nothing to add. Mayor? Um, I'm a, I'll pass as well as we have a closed session. Okay. Thank you. City Administrator? I'm, I'm okay. good. Thank you. And our attorney's not here. Madam Clerk? Okay. And we have nothing to, okay. So our next item would be a closed session. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion for closed session where we have the discussion of the following pending litigation pursuant to section 8E of the Michigan Open Meetings Act, MCL 15.268 for closed session permissible, permissible purposes. Our first being Geraldine Nadine Gurley versus the city of, D of Southfield. And our second is Denzel International America, Inc. versus City of Southfield. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? I'm sorry, no. may I have a motion? I'm going ahead of myself. Madam President, I move we go into closed session. Support. Um, for opinion litigation issues Support. as listed. Thank you. For the closed session, the maker of the motion has to recite what we're going into closed session for. Oh. I thought that's why I read that we were going to go, but I didn't yeah, have the maker. Didn't the maker of the motion has, has to, to recite what we're going into closed session for. And I will try again. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, I move that we go into closed session for discussion of the following pending litigation pursuant to Section 8 of the Michigan Open Meetings Act, MCL 15.268, closed sessions, permissible purposes, um, involving Geraldine Nadine Gurley versus the City of Southfield and Desno International Ameri uh, America versus the City of Southfield. Support. It's been moved by Councilman Cruz, supported by Councilman Brightwell to go into closed session as presented. All in favor? Uh, I'm sorry. Roll roll call call. Got to do a roll call. <laughs> I'm, sorry. Okay. I'm jumping the roll. I'm jumping the yeah. gun tonight. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Banks? Yeah. Brightwell? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Hoskins? Yes. And Taylor? Yes. We're now adjourned to closed session.